Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to bring this meeting of the Pinellas County Commission to order, please, if you might. And I would like to ask uh, our pastor of the day, Pastor Clem Bell, to please come forward. Is he here? I didn't see him. He's here. Oh, there he is, right there. Thank you. Pastor, good to see you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You can pull them both towards you. Ma'am? There's one over here, too. Oh, okay. I think I stay here. It's okay if I stay here. I'm going to get here. There you go. Now oh. pull them towards you. There you go. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus that we appear before your presence in this sparkling city of Clearwater to do business, discuss business things pertaining to Pinellas County, one of the most influential counties in the state of Florida. We was going to ask you to uh, cool the heat down, but you have already done that thank you, Lord. with some rain, so we thank you for that. It is a beautiful day. Behind me uh, sits uh, a lot of residents of Pinellas County with concerns and ideas and things that would make Pinellas a better county. And in front of me are board of commissioners uh, that has been elected and put in place to look out for the county and for the people's residents and all that this county entails. You are the almighty God. You know everything. You got all the power. Therefore, it's going to take a lot of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding for this to be a peaceful, effective, and a prosperous meeting. So we pray for peace and that we would uh, consider one another and to let our speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. For the commissioners, they are going to need knowledge, wisdom, above all, understanding as they do things and listen to what is said and what is done. And at the end of the day, or the close of the day, there will be peace and prosperity and fullness in it. We pray and we thank you for the wisdom that they already have and the progress that has already been made. But there's great things ahead, and you can help us accomplish those things. We are gathered here for the development of Pinellas County in the beautiful state of Florida. This we ask in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now we'll move on to our presentation and award of our hometown, hometown heroes. And I'd like to ask Miss Florida USA 2023, 2023, Caroline Dixon, to please come forward and meet me right down there. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. such a treat. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So our Florida hometown presentation today is going to recognize Caroline Dixon, Miss Florida 2023. On Sunday, May 14th, Caroline was crowned Miss Florida USA 2023. So we want to thank you for being here today, Caroline, and for taking your time to join us. Caroline is a current resident of Palm Harbor and an alumna of Florida State University. She will go on to represent the state of Florida at Miss USA 2023 
in Reno, Nevada. She has won several titles in the past, including Junior Miss American Beauty 2013, USA National Team 2015, and Miss U.S. Tourism International 2020. Caroline holds a degree in Communications and Digital Media Studies and a Juris Master from FSU College of Law. My goodness, she currently works as a legislative aide. And for who? Senator Ed Hooper. I knew that's what you were going to say. We are very proud of you. Congratulations again on your win. Now, is Senator Hooper here today? I do He's not. He's not. He wanted to be here. Shame on him. <laughs> we will be scolding him here shortly. Anyways, um, we got oh, wow. the best of that. Oh, this is for you, Caroline. Thank you and so much. Do you want to come take our picture? I know he does. Here you go. Tony. Thank you. You know what, members? I think you all should come down here so you can get very close to this beautiful woman. <laughs> come on down. <laughs> Am I embarrassing you? No, 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 not at all. Good. <laughs> Barry, get down here. Okay, come on over here. We'll get, come on, stand up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's so shy. You'll have to excuse him. Or do you want to stand in the well, I thought, well, are you all afraid of her? A video to show two hours. I know that. <laughs> do, yeah, do you want to? Oh. Thank you for that we want to play for everyone to see. So without, without further ado. Miss Florida, USA 2023 is... you felt when they put that crown on your head? I mean, I think you saw how I felt. I was in complete <laughs> shock. I had no idea that that was coming. That was my third year competing for Miss Florida USA, so I think it just goes to show that with perseverance and hard work, you can do anything you set your mind to. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Well, we wish you all the luck and Thank adventure you. and joy and love you could possibly ever have. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're very welcome. All right, now, Tony. Okay, now a special guest for everyone to meet is Dev Shaw. Come on up, Dev. I am so excited to have you here. Come on, Dad. You have to be excited too, right? So, are you nervous? No? I thought of a word to ask you to spell. <laughs> Are you up for it? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> my staff person told me, don't do that. You'll embarrass him. I said, he stood in front of the entire nation. How can this embarrass him? <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> Only Janet. Pusillanimous. You got it! Yay. Hooray! He just won, he just won the Ellis County Award for the best fella. That is fabulous. Somebody hooked me on that word in another chapter of my life, so I thought it was a great word to play on you. So without further ado, I'm sure you all know that he, we're recognizing Deb today because he is the 2000 and 2023 Scripps National Spelling Bee Champion. Deb is an eighth grader from Morgan Fitzgerald Middle School in Largo. Where are you going to high school? Uh, Palm Harbor. Palm Harbor? Palm Harbor. Nice. That's a big school. So uh, we want to thank you for being here, Deb, and especially Dad for being here as well. And so we've all seen how your hard work has paid off, and you should feel very, very proud of yourself. We're proud of you, too. I know your parents must feel elated and proud of the young leader you are becoming. Aside from spelling, Dev likes to read, play tennis, and play the cello. He also likes to solve math problems with his friends. Congratulations again on your win. Now. What was the word that you won with? Samophile. Want to spell it again? No. <laughs> he already won. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? He Come already in. won. <laughs> yeah, he did already won, and I am just teasing him a little bit because, you know, that's just who I am. <laughs> How did you feel when he won? Oh, quite relieved uh, because it has been like he has been working for uh, many years almost like six years but the uh, last four years it was extremely hard work and so both me and my wife we were like everybody and uh, my elder son as well who is in uh, Yale right now mm -hmm. so we were like so when he won it was like oh wow finally his hard work actually just uh, paid off paid off in a big way so where are you going to college do you know no I'm sure you'll have your pick wherever you want to go. So this is for you from the County Commission. And maybe one day you'll come join us on the County Commission. Okay. Yeah? Okay, because by then Commissioner Eggers is going to be looking for someone. And so will Commissioner Flatvala. All right, so let's get our yeah, picture taken. He has a long way to go. Just he <laughs> does, but we, we're not worried about him getting there, are we? <laughs> no, no. No. So let's put him in the middle. Yes. Is that all right? Yeah. Can you bring the desktop right there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Samophile is a noun from Greek. A samophile is an organism that prefers or thrives in sandy soils or areas. Samophile, may you please have the sentence? Any samophile, for example, a cactus, would flourish in the Arizona desert. Can you say it for us? 
Samophile. 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 P S A M M O P H I L E. Samophile. That is correct. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks, wow, congratulations. That's so Isn't cool. yeah. nice. that special? Yeah. Congratulations. Very nice. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right. So now we have the National Parks and Recreation Month proclamation. I'd like to ask Brian Beckman, Vice Chair, and Miles Kroom the science advisory member, both with the Pinellas County Parks and Conservation Resources Advisory Board to join me at the podium. They will be accepting the National Parks and Recreation Month proclamation. Hey, Brian, how are you? Parks and recreation programs enhance our quality of life by contributing to a healthy lifestyle, community building, economic development, and environmental sustainability. And parks and recreation activities and leisure experiences provide opportunities for people to live, grow, and develop into contributing members of society, as well as boost the economy, new business, and increase tourism. And Pinellas County Parks and Preserves provide outlets for physical activities, socialization, scenic beauty, and presentation of habitat for native plants and wildlife that create personal connections and experiences which help strengthen families. In Pinellas County's parks and playgrounds, nature fields and open spaces, cultural and historic sites make the community an attractive and desirable place to live, work, play, visit, and contribute to our ongoing economic vitality. And Pinellas County's parks, preserves, greenways, and open spaces provide a welcome respite from our fast-paced, high-tech lifestyles while protecting and preserving our natural resources. And the National Parks and Recreation Association and the Florida Recreation and Park Association designated July as National Parks and Recreation Month. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that July 23rd be recognized as National Parks and Recreation Month. And here is the proclamation. Well, okay, I need some help. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so. Do we, we don't have a video, do we? No, do we? Yeah, there isn't a video, is there? <laughs> what? There isn't a video, is there? No, but there should be of all of our different parks. Parks, parks, parks. I know I have to put the R in there. Hi. What? This next one is the Employee Recognition Awards and Video. I mean, awards and video. <laughs> yeah, we have a video for this as well. Uh, and the recognition is for Jeremiah Nugent. Jeremiah, <laughs> come on up, please. Hi there. 
so we're now, hello. Hi, I'm Ms. Ball. Can I come with you? What? I'm Ms. Ball, so I thought that I'd come Oh, with well, of course. Well, what would we do without you? He wouldn't be him. here. Come on up. Uh, we're now going to recognize one of our outstanding Pinellas County employees with an Employee Appreciation Award. Today, we have one employee, Jeremiah Nugent, to recognize for his years of delivering outstanding customer service for our residents. Jeremiah is a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning mechanic with facility management. He makes sure all of us are met with cool air, air time anytime we step out of the sun and into a county building in the nor northern part of Pinellas. In his years with the county, he's developed into a versatile technician who's, capably, who's capable of quickly solving even the most difficult repairs. I'd like, uh, I'd like you, Jeremiah, while we watch a video about his role and accomplishments, to just sit back and relax for this recognition today. Good. <laughs> My name is Jeremiah Nugent. I'm an HVAC mechanic for Pinellas County Government, and I take care of air conditioning and a lot of other things. I came to the county as a property and stores clerk. My background is in electrical and engineering type stuff, so uh, as soon as I got moved over to real estate management, I started trying to work myself out into the field, and once I got out in the field, that's where I stayed. He apprenticed with the uh, lead electrician and he learned a lot of uh, his electrical skills that way. And then he also worked uh, with uh, myself and other HVAC mechanics and he learned that trade as well. I kind of call it like we're HVAC firefighters. We got to get out there as soon as a call comes in and try and get it up. I've had chillers go down for courthouses and traffic areas. And if I didn't get it back up, they were gonna have to shut the building down. I got a call that the air was down at the White Chapel in Palm Harbor and that there was a wedding in about two hours. I get in my truck, I drive up here to uh, Palm Harbor, open the control panel in the air handler. I noticed right away what it was. It was an electrical issue. I was able to reroute the power, get the air handler and the air conditioning system back up and it was good within 20 minutes to a half hour and the wedding went on without a hitch. What he did was actually an electrical repair on an HVAC system, but calling someone out even after hour service, I don't know if you would have got the same result because uh, of his technical ability to improvise on what needed to be done. In my eyes, he saved the day for that family and their wedding. I'm Jeremiah Newton, and I am Pinellas County. How about you introduce your boss to us all? Hi, <coughs> Christy Carpenter. Oh, Carpenter. <laughs> Very nice to meet Don't you. Put me in front of people. This is my did you hear oh, what he said? Yes, I did. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, this is your award, oh, and I'm you. very proud to present it to you, Jeremiah, and thank you for all of the hard work that you do. And I know Jeremiah wants to tell you just a little bit about the, the group he works with and how talented. Yeah, they, uh, the guys I work with, they're really talented. They've taught me over the 30 plus years I've been here, you know, a lot of stuff. And uh, I couldn't do any of this without them. You know, they, they, this could be any one of them up here because they all step up in the time of need to, to make things happen for the county and work. So, Excellent. Yeah. Do you have anything to say? Nope, he covered it. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Well, I know that bride and groom are very happy that you were there. And I hope so. To say you <laughs> saved the day is a bit of an understatement when you're planning a wedding. Barry? Well, as you can see from the pictures, I mean, th this is such a specialty area, and the talent and the skills that it takes for these very large systems is amazing. So, you know, congratulations on working yourself up and, and progressing. And we're very, very, you know, happy that with the entire team and all the work that you guys do Thank to you. make day-to-day -day operations go on. It couldn't happen without you. Thank you so much. Um, and we have, we have his family. Can we get their family up?
Okay, young man, what is your name? Michael Nugent. Michael, welcome. And you? Jeremiah Nugent. Welcome. Uh, Ariana. <laughs> Ireland. Italia. Oh my God, we've got the World Trade Center here. <laughs> Nicole. Welcome. Gigi. My goodness. <laughs> this is my baby brother. <laughs> <laughs> Look at these beautiful young people here. Yeah, thank you. So, can we get a picture with everybody? <laughs> what? You two will wedge in between the chair here. Okay. Right there, and that'll leave that open. And you can pull that up right. And then. Put those microphones down. So you hold them right. I would. So now we have uh, one extra thing that we must address this afternoon. And I am very proud to introduce to all of you the woman who is the glue that holds our county together, Della. It's Della Clark. Come on. Come on up here. And while Della's coming up, this is a special recognition, commissioners just in recognition of all that Della does. So we're just gonna start by playing a little video. <laughs> Della's contributions to the county are just so understated because she does so much behind the scenes to make us all better. When you're setting the agenda, Della's making sure that everything is in place. She's that final check to make sure things aren't missed. It's that attention to detail that just makes her invaluable. But I will also tell you, Della does so much more than just agenda review. As I'm thinking about how I respond to issues, how I'm thinking about how I go out, she provides advice. She just has that common sense approach to things that makes you think about a policy or what we're doing or how we approach something, which in turn, I advise the commissioners come out with a better public policy. Della is uh, one of the pillars of the community of the county government, of the administration of, the go of Pinellas County. I've been for many years on the Tourist Development Council. Tourism is our business. She understands what tourism is. She's the coordinator to bring the community together for the purpose that the county needs. One of the other things that I would say that probably a lot of people don't know that we consider her the coordinator for the employee picnic that goes on for Pinellas County that I believe the county administrator puts on the, each year, and it's done in the San Key Park. The county commissioners come and see it and show their appreciation. Her heart is in that. She's really there to make everything happen, and she's on the phone ahead of time to make that a great event. She cares so deeply about our employees. Whether we're talking about the county picnic, where we're really thanking our employees, she organizes all of that, um, but we're, she's always thinking about and giving us thoughts on how we can make our work environment better, which obviously if we have a happy workforce, we respond better to our citizens' needs. She really has our residents' best interest and the county commissioner's best interest at heart. And she's that quiet voice behind the scenes that really makes all this happen. Now, the, 
we were able to keep this a secret for a long time here, which I, if, I, if, I, if she had found out, it wouldn't have um, arrived here because she wouldn't have allowed it. And, and, and so we really just wanted to take a moment to say how special you are and how much we appreciate everything that you do, you know, thank you. And, nice and thank you so much. I said, you'll pay for this. <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> So, commissioners, we're taking a few things out of order this afternoon, so just bear with me for a moment because it's Della's fault. She came in at two minutes before the meeting started to rearrange everything for today. So I'm just hoping I don't mess it all up on her behalf. Oh, I need my glasses. Now I can't see. Um, yeah, I have to be able to read it yep. first. Yep. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I need my notes. Where are my notes? Give me the agenda over there, please. Yep. Please excuse us for just one moment. Like I said, it's Della. <laughs> yep. All right, so um, I would like to invite up Kim and Chip Allison. Come on in behind me, please. Thank you. How are you? Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I know much. it's a bit of sweet day. So um, this is a special, very special resolution supporting the honorary designation of alternate US 19 Edgewater Drive, Broadway, Bayshore Boulevard, which is SR 595 from Orange Street to Orange Drive as the specialist Zachary L. Shannon Memorial Highway. Mm -hmm. And this recognition has been signed off on by the governor and all of the other appropriate people to make this possible. On March 11, 2013, Zachary L. Shannon, especially a specialist with the United States Army, was killed in a UH-60 black helicopter crash while serving in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Adoption of the resolution will sp support the honorary designation of alternate U.S. Highway 19, Edgewater Drive, Broadway, Bayshore Boulevard, from Orange Street to Orangewood Drive as the SPC Zachary L. Shannon Memorial Highway to recognize his service and dedication to the citizens of the United States. Zachary Shannon was a lifelong Dunedin resident and graduate of Dunedin High School, and we are so grateful for his service. Thank you so much for being here and sharing a little bit of Zachary with us this afternoon. I'm very grateful to, uh, to you. You're welcome. My son was in Afghanistan at the same time, and he was an Apache pilot for Apache helicopters. So, I know. I do understand in more ways than you could imagine. So, thank you again for being here. Let's um, slide over a bit, and we'll get our photo taken. I move approval um, as it relates to the resolution. Second. Okay, can we all wait and vote until I get back sure, up there? Sure, sure. So I can be up there as well. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for coming to sure you <laughs> You're welcome, yeah. man. Flowers on the flower. <coughs> 
I've done that a whole Family member, thank you so much. Right you want to state the gentleman, I guess, a family member, a friend. You okay? Oh, uh, he's Robin. He, 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 he wanted to take a picture, so I'll just make oh, sure. So, do you want a Robin picture? Yeah. Thank you. You want it? Yeah. Come on up. And who was this gentleman? Oh, uh, Rob. Rob. He's a uh, member of the Postal Service, the DSS Postal Service. Oh, come <laughs> on. Well, no, there. you come up and get your he picture. He wants to get a picture. <laughs> That's not nice. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so it's been moved and approved and Second. to accept this resolution on behalf of Zachary. And without further ado, Commissioner Eggers would like to say a few words, please. Yes, we'll uh, yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank Representative Anderson and Senator Hooper for bringing this forward um, this past session and getting it approved by the governor. Um, Orangewood <laughs> Avenue is right at the uh, the line at city line in Dunedin, and it goes up to Ozona along Alt 19, and, and very fitting. Um, and Chip and Kim are, that are up here, uh, incredible parents, um, and a military family, unbelievable. Um, and they created this young man. I got a chance to meet him at high school before he went off um, to serve. And uh, just a, full of life, a great young kid, and was so excited to, you know, to, to defend our freedoms um, overseas. So I just really wanted to say thank you, Joe and Rob, family, kids, her, their kids as well that uh, have served. Um, Kim is a gold star mom. And when she, in the very beginning, she, she rested on folks giving her assistance through all that she went through. But she's an amazing woman because she now does the same for others. Um, and she's everywhere. And I just wanted to say thank you to you, Chip, for your support, um, for all that you've done to support the families um, that obviously have, have run into the issues that, uh, that you ran into when you lost Zach. Um, and uh, just really wanted to say thank you from the bottom of our heart and, uh, and know that we love you, um, that we care for you. Um, I remember a few weeks after he passed, uh, he was killed, uh, he came home. He came home up Pinehurst, and uh, I could I could still get emotional about it because he was um, the whole town came out and welcomed him back, um, and it was a, it was a, incredible because at about nine o'clock nine thirty I was wondering well who, where is everybody and about eleven o'clock the street was lined to to welcome you and your family and Zach home. Uh, obviously went to Dunneen High School. Your home was right down the street, um, and just wanted to say thank you for your service, your kids' service, um, and for your kids uh, giving the ultimate sacrifice. Great parents, and uh, we love you. Thank you. And
And so now, uh, please be prepared to vote. And we have our new machines today, so. Um, okay. So the motion, the resolution passes. Thank you. Now we're back on the agenda and citizens to be heard. The first is uh, uh, Jack Nowakasak. No, I'm going to murder this last name. Noah Tarski. That's it. Noah Tarski. Did I get it right? Uh, last time you got it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Third time's a charm. Third time is a charm. Thank you. Please proceed. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Notarski. I'm here representing the community of Fox Circle. I've had a lot of the neighbors turn out in support for this. Um, unfortunately, I'm not here on a positive note. Um, the residents of Fox Circle, Clearwater, uh, Florida, uh, have been dealing with a hazardous situation um, in our neighborhood for quite some time. That, prop that hazardous situation is the property at 1825 Fox Circle, Clearwater, Florida. 33764. This account is an abridged version to fit in the three minute window. The property at 1825 has, has been long standing, uh, sorry, has been a long standing issue due to health, safety, and illicit activities and has become a severe concern since the garage fire of 2021, which rendered it unlivable. It subsequently attracted a rat infestation causing damage to, a nearby, to nearby properties. The property owner's lackadaisical approach to repairs has allowed this house to further degrade and dilapidate. Countless complaints have been made to the Pinellas County Construction Licensing Board, leading to numerous investigations since 2021. Despite the April 24th special magistrate hearing uh, that occurred in this room, um, favoring the PCCLB's findings, problems persist with the property and it is currently being occupied by unqualified laborers, squatters, and squatters, leading to health and safety concerns both for the tenants and most notably deaths and overdoses that have occurred at this property. We, the community of Fox Circle, have witnessed many disturbing, distressing, and dangerous situations, most recently including the impounding of an unregistered vehicle, a visceral and very visual drug overdose and an arrest in July 2023. There continues to be incidents of harassment from the property, property's transitory denizens, unregistered vehicles, and multiple drug-related activities that affect the daily lives of the men, women, and children of Fox Circle. The Fox Circle community is seeking an immediate investigation into potentially an exp well, not potentially, but into expediting condemnation of the uninhabited property. We demand action to ensure the neighborhood's safety and preservation and have lost patience with the illegal activities and hazardous conditions at this property. I present to you a whole lot of other information too, but I present to you a signed petition from every permanent resident of Fox Circle and the properties immediately surrounding 1825 calling for action. We hope that the Board of County Commissioners will act to protect our community. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. You did very well to wrap that into three minutes. Next is uh, Lisa. I, I, I'm having a hard time reading the last name. Is it McNeil? Yeah. I'm, not. I'm sorry? She's waving. Waving her time. Oh, you're waving your time. Okay. In favor of, I'm assuming? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey Moose, Moose, Jeffrey. Yes. 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 Would you like to come up and speak? Please state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. I'm Jeffrey Moose, and I live at 1817 Fox Circle. I'm the resident on the west side of the uh, house that's being presented today. Okay. So, 
basically I've lived there eight years. I've grown up in Pinellas County. My parents brought me here in 1974. Love Pinellas County. My concern is I have a daughter that lives at the residence and I have two granddaughters and my daughter has been uh, questioned by some of the labor. Um, so my three concerns are definitely safety, uh, the social, and um, just the uh, overall cleanliness. I've lived there eight years. I've not seen one septic truck pull up next door. The residence has been vacant for over two years. I've had uh, problems with the um, pipes because our houses are built in 1960, so there's a, a cast iron pipe. And mine had problems last year, so I can only imagine what's going to happen if this house was opened back up and all of a sudden whatever has lurked in those pipes for two years plus the new pressure of the pipes. So I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned of what might be in the septic tank. Um, my second concern is the socialness of our neighborhood. Um, a lot of us are um, getting close to the end of the, the work career. Some of us are um, retired. And this has brought a lot of trauma. I'm a disabled veteran and I have some social anxiety and I'm concerned about the repercussions of all this as well as you know when I go out to my mailbox or what's in my backyard I found stuff like that um, and so I'm just concerned and then the safety you know we've witnessed multiple incidents where um, the sheriffs the CSI's dragging people out of there some of them made it some of them didn't um, so it's very concerning um, and it, it stresses me out when it gets nighttime. Um, so I just, you know, I believe in what Jack said and I really uh, think that this is something that can hopefully be addressed because, you know, there's, it's just gotten out of control. It's dangerous. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for bringing this to our attention. All right, and I have uh, Jenna Leard. waving in support. Jeff Unstead? Understood? Yep. Actually, I was going to wave, but I'm going to speak if you don't mind. Please do. <clears throat> I'm Jeff Understead, uh, 1856 Fox Circle. Um, I just retired as the Largo Police Chief after 10 years, served there for 33 years. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in that neighborhood for 17 years. I've got my 16-year-old son with me today to watch this process. Um, it, it's been a long time coming that uh, we've worked with law enforcement. They've been very helpful. I worked with the sheriff's office to try to deal with some of the criminal activity. But since the house burnt down almost two years ago now, uh, there's just no work that gets done on that property. And it's really become a serious safety hazard. And the element that are coming there to work on this, I highly would question their, um, whether they're uh, licensed contractors. And again, like some of my neighbors said, um, Jack will, will be uh, modest, but he and his wife actually revived the, uh, a woman a week and a half ago. And as they were doing CPI on her, the boyfriend was uh, shooting up narcotics in his arm and didn't bother to, to help the other person. He just kept screaming Narcan. So that's the criminal side. We have also the, the other side of the property. It just needs attention. It's, they just uh, started putting uh, plywood on the roof after uh, the two years. And uh, it's, it's painful for the neighborhood to watch. It's a very nice, small neighborhood. And to undergo this now for two years is a little bit crazy. And I know code enforcement's been out there trying to, I think there were some liens put on or fines put on them, but um, it just keeps dragging on and on and on. And it's just a shell, a concrete shell. And again, they talk about septic tank. We're one of the last neighborhoods on septic there. The reports that the septic cover was excuse me, um, uncovered for a period of time too. And they use that just to drop all their needles and drugs in the septic tank in there too. So um, we all try to stay away from that area for obvious reasons. And we'd really appreciate some, some assistance with trying to clean this up. Thank you all very much for your time today. Madam Chair. Yes. Can I ask, him, ask the chief a question? Sure. I know we don't normally talk during this period. Uh, first off, congratulations on your retirement. Thank and you. Thank you for your service. I pulled up this property on Zillow. Um, 
and to call it uh, shell may be even nice. It looks like there's just two wall concrete walls and no, uh, no roof. Is that accurate? Very much. Uh, they just started putting some plywood on the uh, roof over the last month or so. So prior to that, it's just been concrete block walls. Okay. All righty. Um, we certainly uh, will, uh, hopefully county staff will look into that for you. I appreciate y'all's time today. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Cecilia Fanzago. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Cecilia Fanzago, and I live on 1824 Fox Circle. I'm also concerned. Um, I have uh, grandkids that they come to visit me. And sometimes I am walking with a stroller on the baby, and I see too many activities drop off and pick ups over there. I'm very concerned uh, that something will come up wrong while I'm walking there or when someone is coming back home after work. And uh, yes, um, I just want to please do something about this. Help us. That's all I need. We need help. It's a beautiful community. Everybody take care of this, their house, their yard. Their house is completely covered with bushes on the front, if you saw it on, on Google. You can't see nothing inside, so they are hiding everything inside. And uh, not being, uh, I mean, pumping a septic tank, I've been living there since 2010, is very weird. I already there since 2010, but pump it twice, fix septic tanks and everything. So something is wrong. And even the parents, I believe, are involved on this. Because after police leave, they come and we see them clean up their yard. They are picking up things. So to me, is they're picking up evidence. I please, please ask you to, for help. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Howard. Hello. Hello. My name is Laura Howard. I live at 1833. I'm on the other side of this derelict house from Jeff. Um, I'm widowed and I live alone. I, um, I'm concerned because these people are apparently dealing drugs from this place. There's lots of comings and goings and they're degraded, uh, in a degraded state with their cars. And I mean, they couldn't possibly be actual contractors working on the house. And they show up and they go and they show up and they go. And um, who knows who their connections are or who could get mad at them or what collateral damage or harm could be done by these people. They're hooked in directly to the power pole behind my house. I'm not sure who they're pirating electricity from. Probably Duke Energy, maybe my house, I'm checking into that, but super, super appreciate all of you listening to us and taking seriously what we've been dealing with. I'm the newest one on the, on the block these people have been dealing with this for 20 years, and it's just, you know, let's, let's take care of it. We are all upstanding citizens. We all take care of our homes, and this is just a big bruise on our beautiful little street. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Manuel Salazar. Just waving in support. Alicia Rogers. Alicia Rogers. She's waving. Waving. Is she here? She's waving. She's waving. She's not here. Okay. Amanda Eland. Hi. Hi. My name's Amanda Eland, and I'm a Clearwater resident. Um, I'm at 1975 Sandra Drive, so not Fox Circle. Um, I came today to speak about silence. 
Um, I'm deeply concerned about Commissioner Latvala's actions regarding the pride display in the children's section at Palm Harbor Library. I feel he used his platform and his power to erase people, authors, and books. He also forced the library to act in a way that is unconstitutional and violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, not to mention violating the New Parents' Bill of Rights. Latvala's complaints about this display in a public meeting, emails, and social media posts that, as he said on Facebook, quote, the vast majority of residents in North County were opposed to the display were blatantly untrue and damaging to our community. According to the Clearwater Beacon, as of July 6, there were 17 complaints, starting with Latvala's, versus 50 emails supporting the display. And if someone thinks books like these, which was on the display, that say, quote, differences don't have to be scary, are repulsive, as some of the emails, the complaints complained, um, they claimed, uh, no one's forcing them to read it. Um, Commissioner Latvala does not speak for me or my fellow residents. I'm a parent of two kids, six and nine, and we live in Clearwater near my parents and my mother-in-law. None of my family or friends, no one I know, agrees with Commissioner Latvala that this kind of display is harmful to children. What he called a massive display that he never even saw was a tiny 25 book acknowledgement that LGBTQIA plus authors exist their stories exist, they matter, and in the month that's set aside to recognize them. I'm scared of what the commissioner's actions and the result means about who we want to be as a community. When one person, someone who claims to represent us, can silence us in this way, I wonder what else will be silenced and who else will be silenced. I worry that this erasing of our community and our culture is spreading from our schools to our libraries now. We rely on libraries as a safe space for all individuals, a place where books can save lives and change worlds. If someone isn't ready for a book or doesn't want to read something, again, no one is forcing them to do so. But don't take away the right for us to read to share the world with our kids. Don't take away the opportunity for us to find new authors, new stories that can help us move forward, learn and grow. I'm disappointed that Commissioner Latvala does not prioritize these rights, these ways that will help us live together as a community, and I fear for what it means for the future. We are here in North County. We exist. You cannot silence us, and everyone is welcome. Thank you for listening today. Thank you very much. Uh, Geneva Nelson. Somebody turn that off. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Geneva Nelson, 1049th Street, North, Unit 106, St. Petersburg, 33710. Um, this is about number 39 on the agenda. I'm glad you're discussing cooperating with the Tampa Bay Nitrogen Consortium. Decreasing nitrogen in the bay is one of the ways we can help prevent red tide and make sure that our environment stays healthy. Considering that half of all nitrogen in the bay comes from stormwater runoff, one of the best ways we can reduce nitrogen is by capturing and filtering stormwater runoff before it reaches our waterways. Rain gardens and bioswales are in inexpensive, effective ways to do this. Rain gardens capture um, stormwater runoff off and filter up to 90% of pollution in the water, all for the same amount of money it costs to create traditional landscaping. As the county moves forward in participating with the Nitrogen Cor Consortium, I hope you considerously consider amending the stormwater policies to increase the use of rain gardens throughout the county. Thank you for letting me st speak, thank and you. thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Jacinda Shapiro. Oh, sorry. Good evening, Assembly. Yes, sir. Hello. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Thank you uh, for a moment to be able to speak on the rabbit banning for retail. Um, I am a resident of St. Petersburg. And uh, first, I just for a moment, I think we all love dogs, right? So I want you to think about a feeling you might have if I say puppy mill, right? So now I want you to think about how you might feel if I say rabbit mill. They're the same situations. Um, and the problem we have with the overpopulation of rabbits 
are contributed by the sale of them in pet stores. Uh, most of the rabbits are actually taken uh, when they're really young at about four weeks. And also the care is not really explained what is entailed to care for a rabbit. Um, my son actually shows he has a lot of experience building shelters and sanctuaries and caring for animals that are not easy to care for. And he has chosen to work in a pet store in Tampa to help educate people who don't understand how to care for certain animals once it is rarely done. And most of the staff don't know and don't know how to teach. Um, we do have an overpopulation of the rabbits, and these pet store, store cells contribute to that. And I don't think we want to be like Fort Lauderdale that has an invasive domestic rabbit problem, because what happens when we don't want that animal? Uh, if we don't dump it onto a sanctuary or, you know, some place that's willing to take it, then sometimes they just get dumped outside, right? And the way to prevent that, and I believe rabbits are third next to dogs and cats that are not wanted, is to ban the retail sale of them. First thing is they don't come from good conditions. And the second thing is we have way too many of them. They do need special care. They need special vets. They are very fragile. And so I would like to hope that I get your support in banning the retail sell of them. It, they've been banned in other counties and uh, uh, other cities, and I'd like to see them banned uh, in St. Petersburg. Thank you. Thank you. Renee Rivard. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Hello, commissioners. Renee Rivard, P.O. Box 76013, St. Pete 33734. Hope you had a nice vacation. Uh, there were a lot of unwanted pet happenings last week. First, there was the fire at the Madeira Beach Alligator and Wildlife Discovery Center at Johns Pass. I uh, haven't heard an exact number yet, but the owner said they lost three bunnies, three skunks, 25 frogs, a pot belly pig, eight squirrels, 15 snakes, and more than a dozen other reptiles. One source said 60% of the animals perished. The owner said 95% of the animals there were pet surrenders because people don't know how to care for them or are unable to care for them. Then there was the Largo rabbit colony rescue that I emailed you about. I was able to talk with the cat rescue gal that rescued them. There weren't 12 rabbits, like I said. There was 17 rabbits. Um, some were hit and killed by cars. And I also believe I emailed you about the 100-plus rabbit colony out of Fort Lauderdale. It is alleged that a backyard breeder dumped rabbits in her neighborhood before moving out a couple years ago, and they quickly multiplied. Now, private citizens are forced to chip in tens of thousands of dollars to spay and neuter and house the rabbits. I will email you the news articles that came out and the uh, photos for the, um, the Largo rabbits uh, the cat rescue gal sent me. Last week, I talked with a Sarasota pet store owner who told me he has no return policy on rabbits. Later in the conversation, he said he gets rabbits left at his business doorstep every week or every other week. That is testimony that many people make mistakes by impulse buying rabbits and not knowing what they are in for. It is roughly $400 just to spay a rabbit in Sarasota County. Our hope is that you will help by considering a retail rabbit ban or even an Easter ban will help. In the meantime, it would be great if you could add rabbits to your existing breeder licensing and inspection requirements that you have for dogs and cats. We made some progress with Sarasota County. Their animal services has launched a test program to help with, spay, with uh, stray rabbits and guinea pigs. They will pick them up if the animals are contained, the Humane Society will spay and neuter them, and then animal services post them on their website for adoption and houses them in their lobby. They said so far the program has been successful. All of the rabbits taken in have been adopted out. We asked Pinella, Pinellas Animal Services and SPCA if they would entertain a test program like this and also find a way to offer low-cost rabbit spay-neuter to the public. 
That would be one less reason for folks to surrender uh, their rabbits or dump them outside. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Pastor Mack. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Pastor Mike Johnson from Largo, uh, 1295 Church Street, Largo, Florida. I'm uh, kind of like one of those native Floridians. I've been here nearly all my life. I, uh, I went away uh, to the military, and I left the military, and I came back home. I couldn't stay home, so I went to New York. Uh, <laughs> I, I went to New York, and New York was worse than Vietnam, believe me. But anyway... <laughs> Anyway, when I uh, nice. went in the military, I went in the military, uh, and I was thinking I would find life. I mean, I was encouraged by this powerful country that we have, and I'm a young guy, didn't have a father, like that, that kind of guy. Mother did the best she could, raising us up, and she did a good job, I think. Look at me, okay? Yep. Anyway, <laughs> I'm bragging on myself now. But... Uh, I went in the military, and what I was thinking is that if I'm going to be going to the military, back during the time I went in the military, everybody was going to Vietnam. Everybody, okay? All Marines anyway. And so I was thinking, well, what if I uh, go to Vietnam and I don't come back? I'm only 18 years old, right? And I'm saying, you know, uh, God, if you're out there somewhere, I want to know you, man. I mean, I don't mind dying and not going to heaven. But if I die, I sure don't want to go to hell, if hell was real. I didn't even think hell was real because I didn't think the Bible was real back in that day, quite honestly. But I was so sure that um, the military would teach me a little bit about life. And I, I found out was still, even, even in the military, you got your choice. You can choose wherever you want to go. And a lot of times, this stuff is not explained to us. And a guy like me, I don't know where to go. And so I ended up in Vietnam, and I... I had a couple of very close times that I almost were killed. I would not kill, I was brought out. Lately, I had a couple of, I would say, closer death experience as I went to the hospital and I'm thinking, well, what's going on here? I mean, really, I was almost out of here for a couple of times and I got out and out again. Anyway, I wanted to say on, I think last week, a couple of friends of ours, of mine, we went on the beach, on Clearwater Beach, and we went out there because we wanted to be some kind of a sign for God, for life, for life. God is life, guys. And I, we went out there, and I had this one sign, red and black. It says, you must be born again. And I had a couple of guys come up and ask questions. They said, why do you be born again? Well, you were born the wrong way the first time. The Bible says all of us were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And the Bible says God laid the iniquity upon us all. Upon all of our iniquities, it laid upon him for our sins. And he, Jesus Christ, according to the word, died for our sins on the cross. Thank you, Pastor <laughs> Thank Mack. Thank you, Commissioner. God bless you. And uh, may you be born again if you're not. Thank you. Uh, David Balagatis, Jr., Good afternoon, David. Hi, good afternoon. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. The inner tidal waterways of Tampa Bay have been in a steady state of eco-destabilization for decades. Much of the environmental degradation to the waters of Tampa Bay could have been prevented, but prevention was not the objective. The slow and steady decline leading to the environmental collapse in the waters of Tampa Bay have been done deliberately through a multitude of factors, mostly through passive means. Such eco-destabilization started approximately 100 years ago with the construction of the Ben T. Davis Causeway, which today we know as the Courtney Campbell Causeway. The causeway serves to constrict 
choking off the necessary tidal flow to the estuary waters of Safety Harbor and Oldsmar. As a result, the oyster beds in North Tampa Bay have failed and the schools of mullet that once filled the waters have lost their ability to thrive. Absent adequate tidal flow, the ecosystem has destabilized and failed. The estuaries of Tampa Bay also suffer from direct contaminations as well. Stormwater runoff directly draining from our streets has polluted Tampa Bay and has caused significant environmental damage and breakdown of the ecostructure. A primary concern of interest is the direct pumping of treated sewage directly into the waters of Tampa Bay. Decades of pumping partially treated sewage has caused an accumulation of nitrates that have infected the water. The chlorine used to treat the sewage has caused the destabilization of the pH balance of the natural habitat. As a result of not preventing such direct contaminants, the grass flats necessary to support aquatic life are dead and dying. Deliberately, this same scenario can be said for the intercoastal waterways of Port Charlotte down in Fort Myers to include the Indian River Lagoon from Titusville down to Sebastian's Inlet to include the estuary here behind Caledicia Island. Sadly, I feel the financial cost of remediating such environmental ravages are a deliberate objective used to benefit long-standing crony capitalistic pursuits enhancing a draconian system of government in their capricious undertakings charging the taxpayers for such uh, charging the taxpayers to for the cleanup of such deliberate environmental devastations thank you thank you at break pound Greg Pound Largo, I would like to put this picture up so people can go ahead and, um, and see this tragedy we had this past week in St. Pete. Where is that? Right here? Is that it? Okay, this, can you put this so that people can see it? This is a picture of the Gay Pride Parade, and this is just one. I'll show you some other pictures. Um, I made a sign and it said, if you don't like the way you were born, try being born again. And Psalms chapter um, 11, verse 3 says, if the foundation be destroyed, what then can the righteous do? Can people see this? I'd like to I'd like have we people. We can. Yeah, yeah. I know you can. I want these people to see it. I want you to see what Janet Long here said, go down to Gay Pride for, for, and take your family down here. I want them to see this is public. I want you. Are you folks seeing this? Are you seeing this? You need to look at this. This is what they don't want you to see, Okay. These pictures right here of our young people being sodomized, sodomized Deputy. in Pinellas County. That's why in Tallahassee they call this, they call this Penis County, Penis County, Florida. Do you want to remove your honor? Remove for what? For you're, what? For them violating my rights to wait speak? Wait a minute. Hold Just on. To your your remarks. Okay, I want my three minutes. I want my three minutes. Then please make okay, them I'm respectful. Okay, I'm talking to them. All right. Let's make them okay. respectful. Right. You said this was a family event, and you don't want people to see it? Did you go down there and see the perversion? I was there. You were? Did you see all these people walking around like what? that? Make your comments. Okay, this I'm isn't a family affair. You're this is out not, of order, Mr. Pound. This is, not for, this is not for Please families. This is not for families, Janet Long. Thank you should be thrown out of office. Thank you. should be thrown out of office. Okay, we now have several citizens that are on Zoom, and the first one is Ada Henderson. Ms. Henderson, if you can hear us, please raise your hand and Zoom so we can unmute you. State your name and municipality or unincorporated area. Ms. Henderson, yes, you there? Yes, can you hear me? Can you? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, I'll try to keep it brief. I think I have some other of my neighbors that are already there that need to speak as well. Uh, my name is Ada Henderson, and I live on Nebraska Avenue in Palm Harbor. I have been here for 40 years. Uh, I have spoken with many of the residents of what we call Sutherland Heights. 
in Palm Harbor, and we are against the proposed Nebraska Avenue project. Our many concerns were first brought up at the February meeting in downtown Palm Harbor, which was with the project manager and her staff. People filled comment cards, they asked many questions, and our concerns were ignored. <clears throat> they do not like this proposal. We have a large following of residents and a growing number of signatures on a petition to stop this project. We do not want the proposal of a multi-use, shared usage, and whatever else they're going to call this particular 10-foot trail across the front of our houses. We do not want the existing sidewalk on the south side to be widened. We do not want any of the beautiful oak trees on Nebraska to be removed. And we do not want the roundabout on 16th Street. Your proposed project will create a dangerous situation for the pedestrians, vehicles, bicyclists, students, and homeowners. It will restrict traffic flow and access to the high school, the YMCA, and our homes on Nebraska Avenue. Nebraska Avenue cannot become a major road like Alderman, Tampa Road, or Curlew. These other roads have protective fences and walls across their backyards to buffer and protect from the traffic. We do not. This is the front of our homes. And for most of us, the only entrance to our homes and driveways. Remember, this is a residential area. The trail cannot be put on Nebraska Avenue due to too many driveways and cross streets to provide a safe path for pedestrians if that is the purpose of this trail. It will also interfere with mail delivery, garbage pickup, and being able to safely enter or exit our driveways, which already there's a serious traffic problem. A roundabout on 16th Street will restrict traffic flow and the ability for the school buses to safely maneuver a tight circle with buses full of students and athletes from schools, from our school and from other schools during events, both during school hours and in the evening, as well as other extra, uh, extracurricular activities. It will also restrict access and traffic to the YMCA. School buses, charter buses, vehicles pulling work trailers, boats will have a difficulty maneuvering safely around this circle it will cause more problems than they think it's going to solve. We can already see the problems that are caused by the roundabout that's on alternate 19. Neighbors have voiced their concerns at meetings. Uh, they wish to address improvements that we do need for Nebraska Avenue. Uh, if we want our neighborhood to be improved and, and to improve the safety of our neighborhood, we need to address the requests, which have been for stop signs, crosswalks, street lighting, a bike lane, drainage, very important issue, enforcement of the speed limits, traffic lights, and completing the five foot wide sidewalk on the north side for four blocks between 14th Street and 18th Street, which Thank was you. started Your time is 12 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Miriam Parman. Parham. Madam Clerk. Miriam, please raise your hands so we can meet you. Thank you, Ms. Parham. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello, commissioners, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am a FASCO resident, but I represent Florida Voices for Animal, a group with almost 5,000 supporters, and many in your county, and many are working folks who are not able to be here. I have addressed this issue before and hope we will give it great consideration today or in the near future. Your neighboring Hillsborough and Pasco counties, as you know, both passed the bans on the retail sale. And as your neighbor and head of a group with many members in your county, I respectfully request that we also consider passing a ban in this county. You've already heard many of the year-round concerns with purchasing rabbits, and hopefully you had time to read the article that was mentioned by someone today that I sent you addressing the issue of accidental or deliberate release of domestic rabbits. Well-meaning uninformed people buy rabbits as toys for young children who do not understand proper handling of these gentle creatures and can cause rabbits to suffer severe and painful injuries or death in their hands. This causes terrible <coughs> emotional guilt and pain to the children and the parents. So now if we don't pass a ban, then please let's shoulder the burden of the domestic rabbits that get loose and not rely on the nonprofits like the rescues and sanctuaries to take care of the problem. We can't have it both ways. We have to stop the supply or we need to help fix the problem of these unwanted rabbits. These are not wild rabbits and they can suffer greatly when they're released. And out of, this, out of state rabbits can carry and transmit devastating viruses and loose rabbits suffer horrible injuries or painful deaths when they're literally ripped apart by predators. So one huge and wonderful way to work on this problem together is by having the retail shops work with the rescues 
to adopt the rabbits. And this is a win-win for all and can help set, increase the sales for their, all the needed food and supplies for these adopted bunnies. So please let's work together. I do have some neighbors who adopted recently some neutered and microchipped rabbits and they're doing beautifully with proper care. Um, the ones that are retail are frequently too young to be um, sold and they're held in conditions that are less than desirable. So thank you for your time. You've heard a lot of the issues. I hope we continue this conversation to move forward and find solutions that are workable for everybody and reduce the cost and the, the burden to all. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Uh, Steve Ellers. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. I'm here as a uh, resident, 1403 Nebraska, uh, in Palm Harbor. And I'm here to speak about the similar subject to Ada Henderson there. Um, the county's plan, they have a plan right now to improve uh, Nebraska Avenue, and we feel the improvements will actually cause damage to the personality and the environment and the property values of the residents. This plan is unwanted by the residents of Nebraska in its current form. We are more than happy to talk about uh, alterations that will better ne meet the needs of the residents. <clears throat> We're unable to determine the genesis of a shared use trail, which is planned for the north side. It has not been requested by, nor is it desired by the residents of Nebraska or the surrounding neighborhood. We believe it also does not meet the Florida DOT requirements uh, for a trail such as that, as it's gonna have a crossing about every 75 feet. Um, it would be a safety issue, to, to say the least. We've accumulated over 400 signatures already within the last week on a petition. We are continuing to circulate it, and about 99% of the residents are opposed to the shared use trail on the north side of the railway. The destruction of the protected species of oak trees, which is caused by that trail uh, and its construction, and the proposed roundabout at 16th Street. We feel there's a better way after the mess that's going on at Florida Avenue on alternate 19 to control the traffic flow at that intersection. And also the minimum expansion of the width of the sidewalk on the south side of the street we feel is an unnecessary waste. None of the four items justify the destruction of the old growth protected species, live oaks and laurel oaks that line the street and give the neighborhood its personality. What we also oppose is that the county appears to be ignoring the input of the residents regarding the matters of child safety. Every morning uh, during the school year, I have a parade of kids going both ways from the middle school and the high school and at the afternoon in the opposite direction. And we are fearful of a fatality. Um, it's a blind intersection. We oppose the exclusion of a safe crossing of the daily parade of school children crossing the roadway. We oppose the lack of including streetlights in the plan. There's no real need for a uh, trail of any sort if you're not going to even light it. Uh, we don't want to just stay home at night. We pose a lack of detail on the plans for the drainage problems, which do exist uh, along the roadway. They tie into the stormwater subject spoken earlier about. Uh, <clears throat> Nebraska, Nebraska Avenue is an original street deeded in 1927, and it leads to the historic downtown of Palm Harbor. The trees retain water, clean the air, lower the heat for pedestrians, and provide habitat for the ecosystem and the animals. These same trees were on private property. We'd have to have a permit to take them down. Probably would be denied. Quietly in 2020, the council removed the, the historic district of downtown Palm Harbor, which we are upset about. Uh, obviously, I won't have time to finish here, but we appreciate you receiving the comments. And Thank we look you. forward to giving input to the council. Thank you. Uh, Ada Henderson. Madam Chair, um, I think she already spoke. We yes. can move to Sarah Nichols. Okay, Sarah Nichols. <coughs> Sarah Nichols, can you please go ahead and unmute yourself? Please state your name, municipality. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Nichols, and I am also a resident of Palm Harbor. I live um, at 1816 Nebraska Avenue. And um, I just want to thank you for offering this forum and the ability to attend virtually. Um, I'm due with our first baby literally at any time, so the virtual forum is really appreciated. Um, I also want to thank those that have been putting plans together for Nebraska Avenue. The plans are described as improvements, and while I agree that the road and area could use improvements, I'm speaking against a few of the suggestions that aren't improvements to the residents that live here. 
I believe being a resident who lives on the street makes me qualified to share about the actual needs of our neighborhood. I also believe that the fact that I work from home and look at the road day in and day out um, also makes me qualified. It's something that I know the people that have thought through these plans have not done and don't do on a daily basis. So the largest issue where our property lies is not a small sidewalk. On weekends, it's rare to even see cyclists riding down Nebraska Avenue, whether on the road or sidewalks. I am for improving sidewalks, like possible repaving and continuation in areas on the north side where it ends. But building a full trail that doesn't actually directly connect to the Pinellas Trail is unnecessary and would be underutilized. The area is not utilized now, not for lack of sidewalk or multi-use trails, but simply because the west end of Nebraska doesn't actually connect anywhere directly, even with the current Alt-19 projects. The largest issue is also not the need for removing trees, which are historic, beautiful, and are actually very inviting for the downtown area you're hoping to enhance with these plans. The loss of these trees would be devastating as well to the variety of wildlife that are in my front yard every morning foraging for what falls from the trees. And finally, the largest issue is also not the need for a roundabout near the high school. A stop sign would be sufficient simply because the issue here is speeding. A roundabout doesn't entirely bring people to a stop, which is desperately needed on this road. I call the sheriff's office weekly for more patrolling because I have been honked at attempting to turn into my driveway by those who wish to go 50 plus miles an hour in the 30 mile an hour zone. Our garbage cans have been swept off our driveway by those who travel at high speeds. We can't access our mailbox without ensuring that there are no cars around because of how careless non-residents of Nebraska Avenue are. And I can barely back out of my driveway without a prayer for those that are so reckless on our road. To summarize, based on the proposed suggestions, I am against the north side 10 foot multi-use trail and propose the ADA compliant five foot sidewalks with passing spaces every 200 feet on the north side to continue the entirety of the road. And as such, I am against the removal of our trees. I'm against the roundabout and in favor of a stop sign at 16th Street. I also am for speed cameras as if the city is looking to generate revenue. This is a surefire way to do it. Automatic capture of speeding 10 miles and over is easy money. I am for downtown improvements like additional parking by our restaurants. I am for improved drainage for the areas that need it. And I am for a variety of other improvements that are more cost effective and necessary given this is what I see as someone who lives on this road and observes it every single day. Thank you again for allowing me and other residents to speak. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Tim Ferguson. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tim Ferguson. I'm from Minden Rocks Christian School. Um, I made comments several years ago, or I mean several months ago, regarding the Board of Adjustment and Appeals decision to allow medical marijuana facility uh, to be located within 500 feet of our school. Um, you know, that goes against state statute. I've met with most of you guys and uh, on this topic, and I appreciate your time and consideration. Uh, today, I want to tear, uh, share two thoughts. One, I'm thankful that a medical marijuana facility has not moved in next to our school. Um, and I'm excited about the adoption of the new resolution to repeal um, the resolution that was sent to the, the Board of Adjustment and Appeals. Uh, Noble Properties, who petitioned the Board of Adjustment and Appeals, has not been able to secure a medical marijuana facility to move into that space. Um, doesn't mean they won't keep trying. Um, and uh, through some other work we've done, we believe that won't happen. So just really, really glad about that. And secondly, I want to thank you for, your, uh, for the chance to repeal this resolution 22-7 uh, that's on the agenda today. I think it's a great decision uh, to adopt this resolution, which brings the decision making back, uh, back to the Board of County Commissioners. So uh, I thank you for that. I want to encourage all of you to vote for this resolution, adopt it, uh, which will protect all the schools in Pinellas County. I'm thankful for all the work you've done to bring this resolution to a vote. Um, and thankful for the time each of you has given me over the past year. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here today. Madam Clerk, is there anyone else that's waiting to speak? Yes, Madam Chair, there's one more individual waiting to speak on uh, item number four. Nina Perino, oh you can go ahead and unmute yourself and state your name and your address. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Commissioners. This is Nina Perino. I live at 2678 Megan Court in Palm Harbor, Florida. Um, listening to some of these other issues, I am on board with the Nebraska uh, neighborhood as well. I'm against that. Um, but what I'm here to speak about today is to please initiate 
a retail ban on rabbits. Um, we've been, I've been at these meetings. I've had I had to take paid time off today just to be here today, um, and I've done it several times. Just trying to plead with you to please do something about the rabbit issue. As you know, abandoning an animal is a misdemeanor under Florida state statute. Pinellas County Animal Services does not respond to dumped rabbits, only if they are injured, and Animal Services not take in rabbits, only cats and dogs. Dumped pet rabbits are left up to Pinellas County citizens to try to take care of, as is what, what is happening in Fort Lauderdale with those rabbits that are overrun by a breeder, leaving them behind. So please, <laughs> Please do something about this. Like Miriam said and Renee said, and previous speakers have said, we need to work together, both animal control, the pet stores, and the people that rescue. There is a resolution, but just dumping them outside, being domestic, is not the solution. We can't just have uh, out of control selling of rabbits, especially at Easter time. The same goes with the chicks and the ducklings that are sold at Easter and dumped. It's all the same issue. So I'm imploring and just pleading with you to please do something. Please stop turning a blind eye to this issue and just wiping your hands with it. Okay, thank you so much for your time and consideration today. I really hope you make a good decision for all. I'm done. All right, that is the end of our citizen comments today. And now we are on to the consent agenda. Is there anyone that wants to remove anyone, anything from consent? Move approval. Second. All right, it's been moved and approved uh, to, for the consent agenda. Any, is there any discussion? No? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. And now we are on item number 31. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Item 31 is an increase in the purchasing authorization for Amazon services for, for online marketplace. Um, as you're aware, this is how we procure many items through the county, and it also helps increase our local small business program. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Scott. Uh, may, may I have? So now we, all those, all those in favor, go ahead and vote, the please. Machine. Madam the Chair, machine. the clerk will bring up the voting card. There you go. Okay. And number 32 is the ranking of firms. Yep, this is ranking of firms and agreements. This is with H.R. Green, Joe Payne Incorporated, and Walden Engineering and and this is for building and development review on call services. The amounts are, uh, the contracts are listed within your packet. May I have a motion? Move approval. A second. It's been moved by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Scott. Please, please take your votes. There you go. It has been, that passes unanimously. Number 33. It's a resolution expressing support to participate in a collaborative regional consortium seeking grant funding from the U.S. Department of, Econ of Economic Development Administration. Uh, this is for uh, our designation as a regional technology and innovation hub. This will be us partnering with Hillsborough and Pasco County and seeking federal money to be able to expand if we're successful. Move approval. Second. Second. It's been moved by... Uh, Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Justice. Uh, please take your votes. It wasn't voted. Okay. That uh, passes unanimously. Number 34. This is a resolution endorsing the Advantage Pinellas Housing Action Plan. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, please take your votes. Passes unanimously, number 35. This resolution superseding, repealing, and replacing resolution 22-7 
which assigned the review of request to reduce the state distance requirements for a medical marijuana treatment uh, center dispensing facility from elementary, middle, and secondary schools to the Pinellas County Board of Adjustments. This will bring that decision making back to the Board of County Commissioners. Move, Move approval. approval. Second. Second. That's been moved. Should have just second. been a song. I'm sorry, <laughs> Madam Chair, who was the Commissioner first? Commissioner Lot All seconded it. Yeah. <laughs> you tried to get in there, Commissioner Eggers. You tried. <laughs> All right. That's state. I should have. And that passes unanimously. Number 36. This is the first option of renewal and amendment with Catholic Charities and for the Pinellas Hope Emergency Shelter. Move approval. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded. And so please take your votes. Passes unanimously. Number 38. 37 is a dedication of public use and, and a declaration of restricted covenants between the Florida Community Trust, City of Deneen, and Pinellas County for the Gladys Douglas Preserve acquisition. Move approval. Second. Uh, please take your vote. It's one of the best things we ever did. All right. <coughs> That passes unanimously. Number 38. This is amendment number two to Community Development Block Grant Mitigation um, Program subrecipient agreement with the Florida Department of Economic Development. Move it, please. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Yeah, Madam Chair, I have a question? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Scott. Chair. Uh, <coughs> do, we have a, a, do we have an existing plan in place? Are we just updating something, or is this all is this brand new? Well, I think I can answer, but I'll have Kelly come up. This is a, if you read down under your bullets, it says it changes the reimbursement method mm -hmm. uh, for, for um, del upon completion Delivers of too. a minimum one task rather than on completion of all the tasks. It does not change terms or amounts of the agreement. Right. Okay. Or, this well, is really a Hank item, so I'm going to let you All right, well, <laughs> staff will come up. I'm not sure who. Somebody. So while the item today, uh, good afternoon, Jill Silverboard, uh, County Admin. So while the item before you today is really housekeeping, um, the overall program and the grant uh, is intended to help us uh, finalize our proactive mitigation planning and regional plans, um, and in our case, the countywide flood mitigation plan. So it's supposed to come out with a definite product at the end. Okay. Any What's the timeline on that? Any idea? Mm. Yeah. No. <laughs> Two years. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. And now we are ready to vote. Yes. Okay. Right. Number 39, Barry. Uh, this is a declaration of cooperation with the Tampa Bay Nitrogen Management Consortium. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions, discussion? No? Okay. Do we have the, okay. And that passes unanimously. Number 40. It's a grant agreement with Florida Department of Environmental Protection for the um, Shoreline Protection Pro Program at Treasure Island. So this is the, the state grant mm -hmm. portion. We understand there's issues with the federal, but we want to have this in place right. in case we're able to resolve this. Move approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? No. All right. Can we please have the voted card? Somebody has voted. All right. Um, that passes unanonymously. 41. It's a non -compete, uh, competing continuation of cooperative grant agreement with the United States Department of Homeland Security for the BioWatch program. All right, may I have a motion? Question. Question. I Question. Question. What is the BioWatch program? <laughs> Kelly's on her way up. <laughs> Kelly to the rescue. 
Kelly Levy, Public Works Director. And before I answer that question, I just want to say sorry to Della, because Della did not, <laughs> earlier today, that was not Della's change of schedule. That was my request, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, she took it like a champ, though. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I want to apologize to Della. Um, so the BioWatch program, I can only tell you a little bit because Otherwise, you have to kill me. Well, no, but it is a, a program under the Department of Homeland Security, and so we um, perform some monitoring duties looking for potential chemicals that they have interest in. How's that? Okay. Very tactful, Miss Kelly. I'm impressed. <laughs> so one of those U.S. groups asking us for help. Correct. Of they, us asking. Yes. Somebody yes. There for help. Not this Correct. Group, but another group. Is this part of being a good partner, Commissioner? Yeah. Thinking yes. Thinking same yes. for chemicals. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, where are we? Uh, Move approval. Thank you. Second. And it's been moved and seconded. Can I please have the voting card? <coughs> okay. Thank you. And now we are on item 42. We previously we passed did. that. Oh, okay. 43. So 43, this is an agreement with Pinellas Suncoast Fire and Rescue District to provide advance funding for the construction of a new fire station. This has been in our plans for some time, and so this is the funding. Move approval. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussions? No? All right, please pull up the voting card. Thank you. And that passes unanimously, 44. It's the First Amendment to an agreement with Badger Meter for the requirements. This is for our advanced metering infrastructure system for water and reclaimed water uh, utilities. Um, so this amendment, um, let's see. Well, this is this is the First Amendment mm -hmm. and the bullets within your packet. I forget exactly. I'll have to have Jeremy come up if you have questions regarding it. Mm -hmm. You do? So Jeremy, come on up. Come on up, please. Yeah, maybe you could uh, enlighten let him, us. Let him identify himself. Okay. Hi, Jeremy Wald, Interim Director of Utilities. Thank you. Uh, maybe Go you ahead. could enlighten us and or our residents about what this type of meter is going to allow. So the advanced metering infrastructure, these AMI meters, they allow us to um, digitize, is the word I use, our whole metering system. So it allow us to have, instead of bi-monthly readings, we can okay. go and have up to 15 minute, minute readings. The meters will connect automatically through cell towers uh, to a portal. Customer can have up to 15 minute access to their live data as it's going through. It allows us to consolidate our workforce so we have less people out in the field um, reading meters and actually responding to other types of work that we do, leaks, uh, change outs, new customers, et cetera, uh, instead of actually being out just reading uh, and analog meters, so the old saw mechanical type meters. So for reclaim meters um, that, that are being added is part of this? Yeah, so this, the contract we have currently um, is to install these meters both for the water, potable water system and a reclaimed system. So we're going to be re metering reclaim for the first time. Um, this amendment actually allows the county to purchase the same type of meters that this contract That's is out. So this is a, <laughs> the amendment is before you is We've hired a contractor to go install all these for us, but if we have a new customer, that's not in the contract. So we are going to buy the same meters, and this uh, amendment allows us to buy the same meters, equipment, et cetera, that our contractor is currently installing. And there won't, there won't be an additional charge for the meter to be put in place for the residents? There will not be an, an, a charge to the customer to install the meter. Um, it'll be reflected and it'll allow us to for reclaimed a bill on a per usage is instead of a flat rate fee. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. One of the good things I liked about this when this was first presented to us was also the ability for people to be able to detect much sooner since we only were billing on a two every other month basis. So by the time you get that bill, that's when you notice that your water bill is $200 because you have a leak, but this will allow for the early earlier detection of that um, abnormalities in your water usage, I guess is really what I'm trying to, to point at. So, yeah. Um, and, and the technology, the platform that the portal, as we call it, 
um, actually allows the customer to sign up for alerts. So if you, you can set the parameters that you want it to alert you to, and it will send you a text or an email or if, um, an automatic message, whatever your preference is, say, hey, you have higher usage in this last reading, go check your, uh, your water usage, you may have a leak, as opposed to waiting two months and seeing a bill was too high. So it's not even all pull communications, we can even push communications if the, if the customer chooses to receive those. Yeah, I really like that feature, so thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Thank you. thank you, Jeremy. Uh, any questions, comments? <coughs> Move approval. Second. All right, and before we vote, uh, David Belaghetti Jr. would like to make a comment, please. Quickly, David? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The Supreme Court case 96332 ratifying the reclaim water bonds in that case mentioned that we have unlimited use uh, for the reclaimed water. Now today they uh, intend on metering reclaimed water. Um, I uh, have also recognized in, in house bills that reclaimed water is intended for laundry and toilet use um, later down the road. And I feel as though we are um, systematically, stage by stage, incrementally um, being set up in the water regards to water supply. In my opinion, it, in the early 70s when developers came into town, they equipped every home with a sprinkler system, exhausted the water supply deliberately so that they could re-navigate 50 years today and start imposing um, uh, various forms of water usage based on a deliberate aggregate of the water supply in order to formulate these water charges. And this is unbecoming and unsovereign um, in their nature. And um, I uh, have an objection. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it has been moved and seconded. And so please open the voting card. And that is a unanimous vote. Thank you. Number 45. This is amendment number five to increase the purchasing authorization. Uh, this is to increase our sell platform for the contractor licensing group. Move approval. May second. I have a second? Second. Then moved by Commissioner Flowers, <coughs> second by Commissioner Scott. Please open the voting card. And that is a unanimous vote, all right? Um, number 46. This is the first amendment to an agreement with Asset Works for the upgrade, implementation, and maintenance services. This is for our county fleet management, fueling, dispensing, and accounting system out at our fleet department. Move approval. It's been moved by Commissioner Flowers. Do I have a second? Second. Second by <coughs> Commissioner <of> Justice. Thank you. <laughs> um, any questions, concerns? All right, let's open the voting card. Okay. And that passes unanimously. 47. This is a third amendment to agreement with Born Tech Solutions for additional services, and this is to implement the phase three, which is our HR, HR systems and grants module to our Oracle system. And while we're here, for those that haven't met, I wanted to introduce Peggy Rowe, our interim director of HR, that is sitting out there in the audience. Yeah, welcome yeah, again. Her. It's nice to see you today. Did you want to say anything, Peggy? Like, hello, I'm just thrilled to be back. <laughs> 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 Peggy was the HR director here for a number of years um, <coughs> and recently retired about um, a little bit before we needed assistance uh, and so she agreed to come back for an interim period of time and help us yeah. out. So. Timing is everything, right? Peggy Rowe, interim HR director, thank you for the opportunity to be back. I'm enjoying myself. A lot of things have changed. A lot of things are the same, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So look forward to working with all of you for as long as I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your expertise. Nice We're Move very grateful. Move approval of the item before us. 
been moved by Commissioner Flowers. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Lapel. And please open the, uh, we, any discussion? No? I just, n not a discussion, just want to compliment Jeff Roars and his entire team when we sent, mm -hmm. sit through our um, BTS committee meetings and just seeing the vast number of programs that the clerk's office deals with alone and then looking at trying to upgrade what we have for human resources um, to make sure that it's up to date and that the systems are talking to each other when they can and that our data is being stored as securely as possible but in the cloud for access. Um, and then looking at the systems that we need to purchase for exchanges, I just wanted to say thank you all so very much. I love when we're talking about technology, but it's also great to know that the persons that are presenting are doing it in a way so that you can tie it all together. And it's not the technical lingo, but it's so that we can all understand it. Anyone that has ever attended our meetings, I think they get a laugh between uh, Mr. Twitty, uh, <laughs> the SOE office, Julie Marcus, um, the clerks, certainly the judges for what their needs are. Um, so while it is a, a sometimes a very lighthearted discussion, we do take the work in that committee very seriously. So the last few items have all been an attribute to the work that we've been doing on the committee level, and I just wanted to acknowledge you all and say thank you for that. Commissioner Long is also on that committee along with Commissioner Peters. So thank you for, for that, what you do for Jeff, us. Jeff, I didn't see you over there. You're yeah. hiding behind Kevin, but I just <laughs> cannot wait. I'm waiting with bated breath on our primer on blockchain technology and artificial intelligence. So thank you. Thank you. And ditto to everything Commissioner Flowers said. All right, everybody, please take your votes. And that passes unanimously. 48. It's a resolution approving the issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds, and this is for Lelman Heights. 86 unit multifamily rental. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner uh, Justice, second by Commissioner Pete Flowers. Any discussion? No? Okay. Great news. Then uh, please open the machine and let's take our votes. <coughs> Excuse me. And that passes unanimously. 49. This is the same multifamily housing revenue bonds, and this is for Skyway Lofts. Move this approval. is 66 unit okay. multifamily rental. Second. 60% or below. Yes. And enthusiastically moved by Commissioner <laughs> Flowers and seconded by Commissioner Justice. Please open the voting card. <laughs> and that has passed unanimously. Number 50. This is a rescinding an award agreement with sign-in uh, solutions for staff augmentation services. They were simply unable to perform them under the contract, so the work will be assigned out to other vendors that we have. It's been moved by Commissioner Flowers. Second. Second by Commissioner Justice. Please open the voting card. County Attorney. Under item number 51, I am requesting authority to file suit in the case referenced in your agenda. This is an action to foreclose a special magistrate lien arising out of a code enforcement action. Okay. Move approval. Second. It has been <coughs> moved by Commissioner Scott, second by Commissioner Lapdawa. Any discussion? Okay, please open the voting card. Okay. And that passes unanimously, 50, 52. Under item 52, I'm asking uh, your authority to file a litigation in the reference case. You'll see there are a number of parties listed there. Uh, this is an action for damages resulting from the underpayment or non-payment of services or of charges incurred uh, for ambulance transport. Move approval. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Scott, second by Commissioner Lapdawa. Any questions or discussion? No? All right, please open the voting card. And that passes unanimously. Item 53. I have no reports. Oh. How do I knew that? Excuse Gary? Me. All right, so item 54 is the county minister's oh. report. And under the county minister's report, we're going to cover the 2000. 24 proposed budget. And I'll ask Chris to come on up with it. So, Commissioners, as you heard during the budget information sessions, this year's budget's been a little bit unique. Um, 
we first far started with our strategic plan and really focusing around the things that make our residents feel safe, that they are, are safe and feel safe, as the sheriff said in our meeting. And we continue to implement your strategic plan, uh, which is focused around continuing to streamline access to our behavioral health services, to improving our transportation infrastructure, which has been a, a, an effort for several years to improve uh, the, the miles and the local streets and things that we've worked so hard on our, our, our sidewalks. Um, but also providing for our workforce. A, a, reten a recruitment and retention has been, as we've seen in many businesses, uh, very, very difficult, and we need to address that. And you heard the sheriff having those same challenges within his workforce. We're continuing to advance our affordable housing initi initiatives in partnership with our municipalities. And we're trying to manage a budget that is both sustainable today, but also into the future. So we present a budget and it was delivered to you in, in big bulky form last Thursday. If you haven't set up all weekend reading it, uh, you will get to that as we, as we begin. <laughs> this process won't conclude until the end of September. However, it's a $2.8 billion overall budget. That's just over $1 billion of general fund, the remainder of specialty funds, grants, um, and all the other um, services that we provide. Well, we start out with one of the biggest issues that you heard loud and clear in our budget information session. The sheriff's budget increase this year, as proposed, mm -hmm. and which I do support, is $40.2 million increase. Okay? And as you heard, just to make his salaries competitive with other local law enforcement agencies, $9.5 million. The, Florida, the changes in the Florida retirement system, that's not a choice. That's mandated. Mm -hmm. That's over $13 million. Also, contract changes that he's faced with jail medical, food in the jail, all those different things add up to over $7 million just to keep the lights on <coughs> for him to be able to do the services and provide the services that he provides. He also has some one-time um, needs, such as our jail information management system has outlived its useful life, uh, $4.7 million, a leap year, which is just a, um, a, a pay a timing issue, of almost 700, or a little over 700,000 in a rapid DNA, you heard him talk about, and 900,000. $40 million just in law enforcement. This is an expanding staff, uh, and you're gonna see the same thing throughout as you go through the budget. There are no new positions in the budget where we don't have grant funds or other, other funding means to be able to tie them back. We tried to keep this tight because of the inflationary factors we're, we're ha we have this year just to balance our budget just to be able to maintain the services as we've provided. As you also see, this year we're very excited to implement our coordinated access model. Uh, you've put millions of dollars into that over the last several years, and we're at that point where we should be able to see the fruits of your labor and be able to deliver and open that up this year. This, uh, we're continuing to fund things like the, uh, jail, uh, the jail diversion program and the behavioral health within the public defender's office. This ties in with what the sheriff is doing and the mental health units he provided. You know, back a couple of years ago when he first come to you and requested additional funding for that, we said, show us the data and the metrics because you're also going to get a diversion. Now they can get a call, they can do a handoff when they know it's safe, and then that officer can go on. He's been able to take those same number of positions and using data, be able to farm that out and create other units all up um, into other unincorporated areas. And so now we have them out in Ridgecrest. We have them in High Point. And, and so he's been able to make good use of the dollars that you gave him. But again, it ties into our overall behavioral health system um, and be able to tie these services together. So that same officer out on the street will be able to access and be able to put somebody into a, um, a, a, an appointment if that's what's necessary to be able to help them link services. We've talked about a virtual system, whether they go into an emergency room. Now it can be out on the street at a call. It can be in so many different ways rather than just at a single point and hopeful that the person makes an appointment later. Um, <coughs> now they don't have to navigate that. We can help connect them to services in real time. That's gonna be a, a, a vast improvement with our behavioral health system and probably one of the only in the country that, uh, that does such a good job with that. Uh, commissioners also, as you know, a few years ago we said, let's hold the line, let's keep the rate the same, um, but because we didn't know what was gonna happen in the economy. That allowed us to, and then we, it, we saw all the tourists come. <laughs> and so we ended up having sufficient funds. 
You've asked about the reserve levels for um, a while back. So we want to address the reserve levels. And I think there's an opportunity to do something with our reserves that will have meaningful impact uh, to our residents. We, we all know that if you get three green lights in a row, you know, you want to go buy a lottery ticket because, you know, you're doing really well. Well, that's the timing of the lights. We have a very complicated um, traffic uh, management system because people are going north, south, east, and west all at the same time. So we do have an ATMS system that improves our traffic flow, but that's older technology from when they put that in. We have an opportunity to invest. So we're suggesting within our budget we put eight to 18 million to replace all of the state and county lights, and even where there's a city light built in uh, in a few places, this would not include St. Pete because they have their own system, <laughs> but for us to be able to tie in these networks. And, to, and with St. Pete, we did a study to talk about how to use the same technology to where then we can do corridors, and it doesn't matter if it's a city light or a county light because people don't really care. They want to be able to get from point A to point B in an efficient manner. So let's invest in that. Staff tells us it's $18 million, and we're going to have a presentation coming up on that here um, and next month. But we have an opportunity to invest some money, and I don't know how many quarters we're going to get. Tom tells us it's $18 million, but we'll use that money to improve the most congested corridors and really try to improve moving people from point A to point B uh, in the county. And, we're going to, and we want to use reserve levels to be able to do that, and we have sufficient reserve levels to be able to do that because we saved our money in those years. Hey, Barry, um, excuse me for interrupting sure. you, but when you say we have sufficient reserve dollars, after you get done, are you going to be able to tell us after we use the reserves how much we have left? On slide, on coming up here in a future slide. Great minds think alike. Thank you. I know Commissioner Edgers is going to ask, um, so we're ready. Um, no, and this, we want when we talked about re using reserves and we had this conversation we want you to adopt a policy and it's going to come to you um, having two and a half months whether it's two months two and a half months whatever you decide um, we're, so we're not we're going to make sure that we're financially sound we are susceptible to hurricanes we want to make sure we have sufficient reserve levels to be able to react to that we saw what happened in Lee County the state did come to their assistance in a big way but there was a real backlog and there was a timing issue uh, to be able to uh, actually spend money when you got um, all the systems in place to be able to be to uh, get that reimbursement. So we, we don't want to do anything that puts us at risk, um, but we do think we can take some targeted use of the funds to make a real impact um, on residents' lives. You know, the, the dedicated millage that, that you provided uh, this, this past year, we want to continue that, um, and, and, and that's for road and bridges. We had two previous ones. Um, when we did the, uh, the millage rate rollback, we did a rollback all the way back except for the millage for transportation. You received a lot of <coughs> emails and correspondence this year on local roads. People, they were, they were having to deal with construction in their neighborhood for local roads. Many of those were not scheduled for resurfacing in this 10-year period. There wasn't sufficient funds. So the fact that they're complaining about construction, it means that we're actually doing work, and that's a good thing. So there's, there's a real pent-up demand to be able to, to address uh, local roads. And actually, I th it's so much more cost-effective when we can repave than have to reconstruct after a road has been compromised. So getting on top of our local roads is just so important. And again, we want to continue those efforts. We've also talked about um, our workforce as part of the proposed budget. Um, and, and this excludes the sheriff. You heard his uh, presentation uh, to you is to include a, a salary uh, increase of 4.5% on actual salaries, but also bring in the lowest wage up to $18 an hour. Um, we know that in, in, the, in the county, it is very difficult to, as an entry level worker to be able to rent um, and, and, and stay here. Um, and so we want to address that with our workforce. Barry, Commissioner Scott has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Barry, uh, on the wage increases, are there merit increases on, on top of this? No. No. Ours is all one. We've been working on how to do merit for some time. Um, I'm hopeful <laughs> within another year uh, we'll have a merit command, but it's all one together. There's okay. nothing on top of this. Okay, thanks. Now, in, in this year, in a lot of years, we, um, we do it on midpoint which means that if you're at the higher scale, you get a less, you've been the beginning of scale, you get a little bit more. Right. But the way we want to structure our increase this year, because we're going to address some of the entry level wages, 
that'll create some compression issues. We want to do it 4% on your base salary. We'll go back to the midpoint, but after this year. So is it 4%? On the base before the six hundred dollars, or after the six hundred dollars? It's after it, it's four hundred. It's these. The six hundred dollars is one as um um. Oh, that's in addition to, so it's the six hundred dollars. It's four and a half percent after. Then six hundred. after the after the after the four the four point five percent. Okay. So it's four point five percent plus six hundred dollars. Before the four, the four and a half is first. Yes. Then the six hundred. Correct. Then the six hundred. Okay. So it's four and a half, and what that does is it, it creates some of the compression issues <coughs> that will occur when you bring your minimums up, and that'll create some separation between more in, uh, people that have been here for a year, few years versus people that have been here um, just a short period of time. That was the, that was how that was designed. Now, okay. to your to your question, there's no merit. <laughs> there are um, reclassifications and um, career ladders. That if you if you get your CDL for instance, then you get a career ladder, you get your heavy equipment license, you get right. a career. So there there are some specific things where if you, as you upgrade your skills, there's opportunities for you to advance. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Yes, Commissioner um, Lampella. On the 600 one-time payment, is there a minimum period of time that an employee uh, has to work to here to get that, or is yes. that just? It's is was it just. Ju uh, July to January. Okay. So if they're employed during that entire period of time, then th then they'll receive it in February, I believe. But again, this 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 helps address some of our um, uh, some of our issues within our workforce. Um, it's been you know obviously you know the economy just as well as anyone. Um, this helps to address our, our workforce, keep them, um, and and compensate them for the great job that I think that they do. We've looked at all of the area municipalities, area counties. Um, this is in line with what, and, and in fact, in many cases, lower than what others are providing. But in many, it's it's right in line with them. Pasco's five, Hillsboro's four. I mean, I go on and on. So. Now, Commissioner, going to to your question, our general fund reserves: two and a half months is twenty point eight percent. What we have is we've accounted for one-time transfers to, for instance, the ATMS system that we also talked about. We've also set aside money for future facilities. Yeah. Advance the slides. Commissioner Justice, did you have a question? No. I know, but it, I'm I slipped skipped a slide. That's what happened. Okay, got it. All right. Um, I'm sorry. Let me go back. The, so managing our current situation. So our general fund is balanced. Um, we, as, as you know, and I think people look and they see the overall budget, but so many parts of the budget can, you know, it's just like our tourism development tax. You can't use tourism development tax to pave a road or to pay police. It's very prescriptive in what you can do. It can only be used for tourism-related services. Well, it's the same way with over a billion dollar in our in our budget. Those are prescriptive type of, and they have uh, very specific revenue sources that can only be used for those purposes. The general fund is almost a third of what the overall you know budget is. Our main challenge is our is inflation. We've we've seen this and we've seen it throughout. There's not a contract that doesn't come before you where you don't see these massive increases that we've had to deal with over this past year. This budget accounts for that. Um, our local labor situation, and we only talked about the sheriff's portion of Florida retirement, but that hit all of, um, all of um, for our cost for our employees also. Not as much as the sheriff, but it was still significant. And so we're, all that has been factored within the budget. And our reserve levels, we're at 20, uh, the 20.8% is the two and a half months. We're gonna bring you that as a policy. Um, you, you saw kind of the best practices that's um, up to you for adoption. We, we have transferred within the budget money for, that, or we will, we're proposing to uh, transfer that money for the ATMS upgrades that I just talked about, but also for future facilities, and that's 40.1 40, 40. million. That really talks about future facility needs. You're gonna have some decisions regarding our facilities, whether it's upgrading our current facilities or new facilities. And so we have sufficient reserve to set that money aside to be able to talk about what our needs are there. And that's a good use of one-time money 
that doesn't add to your long-term cost. It's one time for one time use. Um, and then we've also accounted for things such as we know that the um, uh, out at the elections, they are going to be re requesting for next year. They can't do it in a presidential year, but for the following year, they need to upgrade a lot of their election equipment. That's $5.6 million. Uh, furnishings for the hangar, and by the way, it's coming along. They, they are actually now getting ready to move the project. Um, $600,000. Animal Services Building, $330,000. These are all one-time expenses for one-time use. And if, and if we, as you'll see within your budget, that will bring us down to the 20.8% within our reserve level. So it's accounting for the dollars, it's keeping an eye on one-time cost for one-time use, um, and it's also deferring things that maybe you might otherwise issue debt for, uh, for a building, for instance. You can pay cash versus borrowing, and so things like that. So finally, um, this is a big thank you to Commissioners, for the time you spent with all of our departments and our constitutional officers and our budget information sessions, all the constitutional officers and appointing authorities and all of our departments working together to try to come up with a, a reasonable explanation of how we can move forward um, being responsible for now and into the future. We're going to set the maximum millage um, on July the, the 27th. That is simply setting the max millage. So once you set that max millage, you cannot go above that. Um, and then the final budget work sessions will be August 10th and 31st, and then the public hearings for the 7th and the 19th of September, at which time you know, you'll be requested to adopt the budget. There's a lot more detail, uh, obviously, that I covered, um, that I covered here tonight, um, but those are all within your budget. We'll have it set up individual meetings. Um, Chris and his team are available uh, for any and all questions that you have. And uh, with that, I welcome any comments you have at this time. Comments, anyone? Commissioner Justice. Thank you. Just procedural. The, the millage rate setting is just a consensus, not an actual vote? That's that's correct. Okay. Yeah, it's just a consensus, and uh, that's the reason it's on a work session. Okay. Very good. Any more over here? Commissioner Rackers. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I did have a chance to go through um, <coughs> some of the, the, the at least uh, the, the verbiage uh, on the budget, and I thought you guys did a great job at presenting it. I thought it was actually a step up, uh, even from last year, which I thought was pretty decent. Um, um, but I, I won't have any problem setting the maximum millage rate as it is now, so I'm not too worried about that meeting. Um, so. Um, I have a problem. And you guys, uh, I don't know if you have answers for it or not, but um, we have residents that um, probably are suffering more than they ever have um, with insurance rate increases. Now we're talking real estate tax increases. Um, more people are on are, are on, on food programs today than they ever have been, um, and 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 so we so we we are really in between betwixt right now in terms of what to deliver to, to continue delivering service to our residents which we're we're talking about doing but also counterbalancing that with less than a 11 percent tax increase now for all of us who are on save our homes and there's a percentage of those that I've I've sent a few questions that uh, that uh, we're working on but um, there are a lot of folks that are in multifamily housing that uh, their caps are probably at 10 percent um, and so those folks, whether it's real estate taxes or whether it's uh, insurance, those will be passed through. Uh, that, that owner is not going to take a hit on that. So those numbers will all be passed through to not only regular uh, in terms of uh, income level folks, but even folks that are struggling a little bit and may be considered on affordable housing complex. So one of the things that we talk about is, is supporting that group and not have a real issue with it. We also have... Um, um, issues with the and when you look through all the alternatives and I look at the transit trust fund which is a totally broken system that we haven't really addressed at the state level yet uh, and yet we're paying for it and our residents are paying for it basically through an increased millage that we could offset in other ways um, if we had the opportunity to do that so we have a system that's broken and the residents will be paying for it through increased taxes um, 
And so whether it's that, uh, whether it is um, the dedicated millages that we've talked about, re reserve levels that we've talked about, uh, I commend you on using some of those to get them down. We obviously, we built that reserve on the back of COVID because we were anticipating things. And so that reserve level is, I'm not even sure, over 27%, 28% coming into this 27%. Yeah, 27. Mm -hmm. and, and policy is set at 15. Oh, we've talked about maybe 16, 17, 18. I'm seeing the new thing at 20.8%. So um, I think there's, there's, there's room there to per perhaps um, work, work to help reduce the tax burden on our residents. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not going to, I won't be supporting an 11%, but I'm still kind of trying to keep an open mind. I'm trying to get some additional information and maybe some other ideas or solutions to try to help yeah. um, that, that piece, because it is, it is definitely going to be, um, again, another significant hit uh, for our residents. So uh, just, just a couple comments and thoughts, and I'll be talking with uh, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Commissioner Edgar. Commissioner Lapala. Thank you, Madam Chair. To Commissioner Egger's um, point, I have a question on a couple specific items in the budget, uh, and it may be best suited for Chris. On mm -hmm. reference number 946, Building and Development Review Services, a website update was listed for $60,000. Is that something that we do in-house, or do we farm that out to somebody because sixty thousand dollars for a website update seemed farm, farm pretty that out. expensive yeah so when you do so their their website is obviously complicated right. and right now you know good luck finding you know things easily um and be able to find your fees and your all the codes and things like that so this is a major overhaul of their piece so they were uh, gonna sign uh, farm that out if when we do it in-house we don't have the necessarily the staff that goes out and and designs websites they manage them so it's a different skill set and so that piece would be farmed out okay um the, i noticed the on um 734 continuation of the countywide cultural plan for two hundred thousand dollars what exactly is that so that is for um the um uh, looking this is yeah this is the the campus right no this yeah. is the plan. all the, the county yeah. countywide so a year ago and this would be fund, funded out of the uh, tdc funds okay mm -hmm. a year ago we looked at we were getting requests for more money for arts mm -hmm. and we said well where should we invest that money um should we you know give it to creative panels we had groups down in um st pete that had different ideas they had we had but we have um, arts groups throughout the county. We have them in Dunedin. We have them up at Tarpon Springs. So we wanted to get a framework of what are our arts and what is it, are they contributing to tourism? Okay, um, and and so we want this cultural plan really looks at our arts community to where if you want to make additional investments, it's targeted, not just having not just funding what groups request. Okay, um, and this may be more of a jewel question one of the things that I do think we should eliminate um, is the community fund that we have as a county commission uh, it's fifteen thousand dollars that we use um, to go to buy tables for dinners and lunches for nonprofits um, and I think that we should instead use our office accounts and have more flexibility with our office accounts to use that money to go to uh, these nonprofit dinners and lunches. Is there a way that we would be able to do that? Um, <laughs> Not really a drill question, but yeah. yeah. It, so you you do have an office account. It, your office account, um, a lot of it is there's a lot of it is taken up for your your staff and uh -huh. and for things like that. You do have a discretionary amount, so you can use that however you want. Um, I think this was for like tables. When we talked right. about it a few years ago as a commission, it was for like tables for Boys and Girls Club or, or different organizations that you know you may want to sponsor and go to. That's, that's really okay. what that was proposed and, at that time. Okay, and the last one, um, last question I had, and, and I'm not in favor of, or I'm not against this. It's more so something I noticed under the user fee schedule and I wanted to ask about it. And it was the journeyman uh, application and 
and that went from seventy-five dollars to twenty-five dollars. And and my question is, what is the reason? Or what is the reason for that, and what exactly is a journeyman? I don't know. I'll have to find out. <laughs> okay. Because I noticed account? that that was one of the applications that is being reduced. Was it changed in the Tallahassee that we can only charge so much? That's right. Oh, so that's a Tallahassee thing. Tallahassee okay. issue. They changed the um, change the part. I believe that's the reason why we have to. Well, let us look that okay. up, though. Make yeah. sure we're accurate and get back to you on that. Alrighty. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I want to echo uh, Commissioner Egger's uh, comments. I read through the narrative portion of the budget anyways. Right. I haven't got into the other 300 pages, but um, but I thought the narrative was 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 very self-explanatory and, and very thorough and, and well done. So thanks for that. Um, I did want to read um, an email that I received um, from, a, from a constituent here uh, just in, in the last week or so. Um, the subject is 2024 budget in, in, in property taxes. And um, dear Mr. Scott, we had a conversation uh, before the election regarding issues I was concerned about as a 50-year resident of Pinellas and a retiree, and we did end up voting for you. I'm hoping you and the rest of the board take into consideration the hardships our economy has placed on all of us when discussing the 23-24 budget. Rent, food, fuel, utilities, etc. We've all had to tighten our belts to live here. I, along with many other residents, will be watching what happens with property taxes after what is sure to be another year of increased revenue for the county due to high property values. We own a small villa that my disabled daughter lives in that was affordable when we purchased it. Because we can't have homestead exemption, the property taxes have increased every year to a point they are becoming unaffordable. I am sure we are not the only ones in this position. Retirees have purchased investment properties to have income in their retirement that income dwindles as their property taxes increase, they are forced to raise rents in an already unaffordable market. We will be watching closely how the board handles the budget. They need to tighten their belts as the res residents have had to do as well. Thank you. So, you know, just, I've heard for, for two years now, I mean, from the moment I became a candidate all the way till today, I mean, I've heard dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, mm -hmm. of, of these types of, of conversations. And I, you know, I think, I think residents are generally pretty understanding if taxes have to increase when they, when they haven't gone up year after year after year after year. And, and from what I can tell, I don't think we've had a full rollback till, since 2008. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I know, I know it's, been a, it's been a long time. And I think after a while, you start to lose credibility with, with the residents if, if you just take, take, take every, every single year. So I think we have to be real, real careful about, about what we do here. Um, I think we can make a really good argument that our reserves need to be at 20.8%, um, but maybe this isn't the year to do that. Um, you know, also looking at, you know, a 40 million or so, you know, set aside for, you know, future future facilities, you know, I think the, the optics of that could be really bad. Um, you know, you, you, look, you look around the county and there's so many municipalities that either, that either have built new, beautiful uh, city halls or, or, and police headquarters are in the process of doing so or are talking about doing so. And that just absolutely screams that government has, has, has too much money. You know, so I think the optics of that could be, oh, wait a minute, you can find $40 million to buy a piece of property or whatever and then, a, you know, go to bond for a few hundred million dollars to build something new so you all can have a new kingdom, but you can't find any money to give me, to give me tax relief. So I think we have to be real, real, uh, real cautious about that. So, um, you know, I understand that, that, you know, that things are tight. There's a lot of infl inflationary pressures. You know, we've got 60 days to talk about this and, and, and see what we, what we can do here. And as, you know, county commissioners, we have the ability to put in, you know, our own decision packages to the, you know, to the, to the budget. And, you know, I've given that a lot of thought. And, you know, what's the, the most, you know, rewarding, uh, meaningful thing that we could do for, for, for taxpayers? And I think that's a full rollback. Uh -huh. So that's my decision package is, you know, is a full rollback. And as far as, you know, you know building a new kingdom, I think, I think the, you know, the, the kingdom can wait. But we've got 60 days to talk about it, but you that's, that's, that's going to be my decision package going, going forward. So, Commissioner, if I can't address, you know, some of that, because I know there's a lot of confusion. When you have a $2.8 billion budget, um, there's very few people that 
that understand that, and I wouldn't expect them to, right? That's our job. Um, but when we talk about reserve levels and putting, sitting aside money for a facility, this building was built in 1962 um, and has major issues. The choice about expenditures is really not a choice. It's either upgrading current facilities to where people can work here safely, um, or is it cost effective to make a different choice? That's gonna be presented to you in a full packet come here the end of August, and so you're gonna see that. Um, but when we talk about one-time money, one-time money does not, is not ongoing. It does not cover op ongoing operating costs. The reality is that to do a full rollback means cutting the sheriff down to zero for his increase. So no raises for his staff, no raise, uh, and how is he gonna account for the, four, the $30 million of mandates that he has, contract increases, um, the Florida retirement system, that was not a choice. That was a gift from Tallahassee that we got mandated. Um, and so those costs are real, they're fixed, and they are going up. There's no way of accounting for that without revenue to do it. We have done a full rollback except for the portion that we put in the Transportation Trust Fund the last two years. The first time that's been done in over 28 years, 25 years, something like that. So we did two rollbacks in a row trying to account for that. But I, but I guarantee when people go to their tax bill, they're not seeing that. Why? Because the school board is not subject to save your homes. So the increase on the school board is far greater than anything that the county didn't do at that time. And so there's a lot of confusion about the property tax. And you're right, most of the people will save your homes. But Commissioner Eggers is exactly correct. With your, if you're renting, they're getting that pass through. And so, and so we're, we're absolutely sensitive to that. That's why as a staff, we've worked really, really hard to draw that line. You've seen, I mean, the sheriff's about 50% of the budget. You've seen his, his budget go up even each and every year, even though we did a rollback. Mm -hmm. How did we do that? We did that through the efficiency mm -hmm. and the performance metrics that we have within our programs. You see that through reduced number of positions spread throughout the county as we find ways of doing things smarter, cheaper, um, you know, and more efficient. And so we constantly do that to try to keep that tax burden from our residents. This year, um, it, it, came, it came to a head and you saw it in a big way in every single contract, every single thing, and especially in our labor um, thing. So if the sheriff is gonna be able to continue to recruit, well, he should be able to pay the same as what, you know, Clearwater pays. <laughs> same as, and, and he's not even asking to pay what St. Pete pays. And, and so how else is he to compete if he, if he doesn't have the resources to be able to do that? I can't give him that under one-time money because it has an ongoing cost each and every year. And so I welcome these types of conversations. This is your budget, so staff, I'm gonna try to, de de to defend the recommendation. I'll slice it and dice it and give you any information you want and respect the decision you make when we get through it. We'll be happy to meet individually with you, provide any information you can. Um, but I just want the public to understand some of these nuances because um, it is extremely hard. I saw, you know, something in the paper, I mean, they said about, well, don't build a ball stadium, you know, do a rollback. Well, they're two different decisions, you know, they just are. There's not a cent that would come out of the general fund for a ballpark. It would come out of tourism development tax money if there was a decision on that. And, Which and so- Which I might add, I just have to add, that is not a tax that we impose. That was a self-imposed tax on the industry. Yeah, it's a bed tax. I mean, so it comes from our visitors. Most you know? people don't have any idea well, about well, that. Well, but it's a bed tax. It's on our visitors. And so right. it's, uh, it's people that, that, it's our visitors that pay that. Um, we appreciate that. And that's what you pay for minor league ballparks, aquariums, um, you know, things like that. Museums. Arts council stuff, things like that. So. But, but it's very, very specific that can only be used for those purposes. Mm -hmm. one of the, just one other real quick comment. Um, great explanation. I'm glad you said that for all, for all the people that are watching because most people don't understand all of those, all those nuances. I think the other thing that makes it somewhat challenging for us to try to explain this, though, is that you know, we also got $190 million in COVID relief funds. Mm -hmm. So people are saying they go, well, what, why you're you're funding projects now of things that you would have to pay for in the future that you're not paying paying for now. So, so you know, just just topics for discussion for the next for the next sixty days. So, thank you, Commissioner Flowers. You wanted to speak? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I uh, I truly understand all of the comments um, that have been shared. And thank you. Um, Commissioner Scott for that last little piece because that's what I was going to share 
we were able to push some projects forward as a result of the <coughs> COVID relief funds that would have been either on the back burner or pushed further back. We were able to expedite those projects and push them forward. So um, just having done budget sessions um, from my service on city council, on school board, and now here, um, I am and have always been very leery of looking at how we address the millage. Um, I lived through and had to work through the horrific time of when um, the school board, when we rolled back a rate, and they're still playing catch up from, um, from that decision. Um, and consistently trying to figure out how we're, they were, we were at the time, going to rob Peter to pay Paul, um, and for a number of years had to make some real tough decisions. And a lot of that circled, unfortunately, around salaries for employees because you can only do so much with FEFP that is specifically towards children sitting in seats. So much like here, there, there are certain things um, that we have to address that can only come from certain pots. Our enterprise fund um, components, that, that do those dollars are supposed to roll back into that specific department for enterprise funds. You can't slide them over somewhere else. And um, it's very difficult when you roll your rate back so far then to turn around and ask if needed for an increase in your millage. That then becomes a whole nother conversation that often persons are not willing or wanting to do that. So again, you're trying to figure out how you're gonna make some things work. I, I have no problem um, talking about um, you know, how we purchase tables at events and things of that nature. I know when I first got here, I was um, educated on, you know, how the sheriff has a pot of money from um, when arrests have been made related to drug confiscation of vehicles and things like that. Those things are auctioned off, and then that's some of the money that's, you, that's put into a pot that's utilized that we then purchase. You know, he gives us access to that, and we purchase a couple of different things with that to support the community and show them that we want to be at their events. So I don't have a problem with, with looking at that. But, um, you know, a lot of the things that we are dealing with right now, to Commissioner Edgar's comments, um, it, it is accurate. We're dealing with these things because the decisions have been made outside of us. And so when you're looking at increasing insurance, that's not the county. That happened outside of us. When you're looking at um, other things that we have to now take care of that happen outside of us. And so now we're just responsible for making it happen. Not to mention with now other insurance companies that will be leaving the state, that's going to put a pressure on the companies that remain here, which is then going to affect pricing, not just for our constituents, but even for us as a county, for when we are having to pay for different things, that's going to affect us. So we are also the government entity that puts things forward, but we are customers of ourselves, if you will. Um, and so it, I just think it's gonna be um, a difficult decision. I appreciate, um, you know, every year that we have since I've been here, when we have looked at um, providing some form of um, rollback for our constituents because the property values have increased and we've been able to do that. And I'm glad that we have been able to do that. But I just want us to also think about all of the things we have to pay for that have a cost increase in them as well. And so we have to make sure we don't get a choice. We have to make sure our budget is balanced. We can't go into a year without a balanced budget. And we have to make sure that we're providing those necessary things, the very preliminary stormwater sewer. We have to make sure that um, when it comes to um, deep well injection, and we're not allowed to do that, but other people are. So when we're having our um, reclaimed water conversation, it's demand and access. So yeah, more people want to get on reclaimed water, but do we have enough of it to push out to be able to provide them with that so it increases the dollar value that we're getting back in for reclaimed water services, you know? So um, I appreciate 
the binders. Thank you so much for the night reading and day reading. <laughs> and consuming our weekends. Yeah, yeah, thank you so My eyes started crossing after a minute, you guys. I'm sorry. I, I went for our appointment yesterday because I thought maybe something was going on. But, um, it, you know, and I, and I do appreciate, I do like that the community is, com they are commenting on the budget. They're paying attention. So I appreciate that because sometimes I've been in rooms where there's no comment, you know, no anything. So I do appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Rose, for taking notes. Um, <laughs> but um, I just want us to be to be to, to think about that, that, you know, if something comes up, are we able to meet the obligation? Because something is going to come up. Um, are we able to uh, provide uh, convenience to our constituents while also providing them with the necessary services that they tell us they want? They don't want to hear that a stormwater sewer pipe bursts and it's going to take us three, four months to repair it. They want it repaired like right now. That takes money. That takes manpower. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult decision. I'm glad that we're also educating our community on our budget process. Um, and for those people that have been sending emails, because I know we all have gotten them, I appreciate that. Um, but I just think we need to be very, very thoughtful um, in any request that we are making to alter um, significantly where our financial position is related to the revenues that are generated. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe you could, for the, everyone's education, actually define what the rollback rate actually means. So rollback is defined in state statute as the same revenues as the prior year with the exception of new construction and sales of homes. So it is, uh, that is what is defined as not being a tax increase in state statute. The same amount of actual dollars. Yes, sir. So with not really being able to do the same things that you did last year, if you did a true rollback rate, you'd have to cut something in order to balance out your general fund. Bingo. Absolutely. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that people understand that. And um, we're getting, we have been getting a lot of emails. A um, few people who want us to roll back the rates to pre-pandemic levels, which actually would be a significant millage increase because we have reduced the millage for two years consecutively, the first time in over three decades. That's happened in Pinellas County. And you're right, Mr. Burton, the people who look at their tax bill may see increases in other spot because of what city they live in or the school or what people forget is the tax increase, the property tax increases over the years that the state legislature has pushed down through the required local effort on the school tax. That's a significant portion of the taxes. When we were going through the pandemic and we were doing a two-year budget plan, um, correct me, I just, I couldn't remember, was it we leveled, kept level your budget and staffing levels under yours or did we actually reduce? I'd have to go back and look. Um, it's either, I, I think it's a, it was a slight reduction, but I, I would have to go back and look. That's what I thought. So the mm -hmm. increases came from other spots. As we see the, the law enforcement, public safety eats up a lot of the budget, and we're seeing some of those. So um, I, I think, you know, we were all very proud that because of the, the boom in the budget, because of the two-year, we were able to do the millage reduction in the last two years. Um, I would want us to talk about what that actually impacts on the actual homeowner for any decrease that, if you were thinking about doing that this year. Um, is it is it significant or is it, you know, 50 cents? And then what does that impact? Because is it worth a significant decrease in services or meeting our needs uh, without a significant actually impact on the taxpayer? Because I think you balance that out. You want to make, balance that out uh, to make it make sense. Good point. Um, and I think that was just the kind of the notes I was making. But again, um, appreciate the narrative ever, as everyone has mentioned being able to read that in English and understand it uh, uh, is helpful. Uh, not too much budget uh, expertise required, so I appreciate that. Um, and I guess that's why you get the, uh, your department gets the budget award every year for a presentation of budget, so. 17 years, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Latvala. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I neglected to mention earlier um, that I do support the sheriff's budget. Um, and I understand why uh, it is increasing um, uh, for that reason. And so I would not be supportive of um, decreasing his part of the budget. Uh, you know, but I do want to state that uh, in my prior life, I served a couple hundred uh, miles north of here. And for a couple years, I was a budget chair in education. And the state budget 
uh, at least that time was two th made up of two thirds of the education and healthcare uh, in the state of uh, Florida. And uh, there were times that uh, other parts of, of the um, budget had to be cut uh, because of increases in the FEFP or um, increases in Medicaid, uh, which increased every year, and uh, health care and so forth. And so I do want to sit down with you, Chris, and, and go over, um, you know, possible other areas of the budget that can be increased if there is uh, any kind of rollback that we do this year uh, that uh, doesn't uh, harm the, the share. And Commissioner, just on that note, in your budget information session, as part of that, there's a list of proposed reductions that we've defined in there. Those are service level reductions. So it's a policy decision. We say we're going to mow, you know, eight times a year versus 12 times a year at parks. Well, then grass will be a little taller, won't be as uh, pleasant of a park, but that is a service level reduction, a choice that we can make and we can reduce those contracts accordingly. So, so we have outlined those in each of the departments A report to me, and they're there for your perusal. And we'd be happy to meet and go through any of those with you. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, um, first of all, Commissioner Scott, thank you for reading that resident's uh, comments because it was so much more eloquently stated than I did. And I, I, I tried my best, but uh, I think he hit it with his heart and soul. And there are others that are doing the same thing. Your two-year plan a couple of years ago really was, you know, it was it was a one that we needed. We didn't know what it was going to look like. Um, the state increased their their reserves as well, their their dollars during that same time. And we tried uh, you you cut positions that weren't filled. You uh -huh. raised we our that's when our our, our reserve went pretty high. Right. Um, by de by design because we didn't know if the second year was going to require some of those reserves. So reduction. It was mm -hmm. a very concentrated effort, mm -hmm. not necessarily popular, but at the end of the day, it was trying to be careful for the residents in the second year if the, if the economy tanked. And right. so, um, so I think that, that was an important thing. Um, I did, um, did want to say that you know, when, when the values are going up like they are, they're not going to go up like they are forever. Correct. So we have to, my only comment really on that is we need to govern down how much we're spending because otherwise when that does come down, when that does come down, we will have been used to a higher spending level. I just think we have to be a little bit careful. So just to that point, just be careful. Um, and the only other thing I would say, two, two things real quick. Um, one is that when I first came into office, uh, the budget was coming up close to $2 billion, and uh, we're talking about something over $3 billion now. And um, it is, uh, when, I, when I tell people out there, you know, maybe we need smaller government. And I, that, that's when I get people that say, yes. They're not sure quite what that means. <laughs> um, and I get that. I understand that. But it is a, it is a concern that we continue to incrementally grow uh, beyond really what we can probably afford to do uh, uh, fiscally conservatively for our residents. Um, and the only, I have one final question to you, and I'm gonna make sure, because the way I read it, I wasn't quite sure what it meant, but the approval of this budget does not approve the reserve policy, correct? No, that'll be a okay. separate policy. There was, they, a, there was a line in there, and I thought, no. I, no, just went, I wasn't sure that yeah. it said that, so we're, we're gonna be having a separate discussion we are. on that reserve policy. Yes. Um, so anyway, we got some good discussion ahead, but uh, thank you for, for your, thank for you. your time. And if there's no other questions, um, so between now and next Wednesday, um, I'll be a, in a cabin in the woods. So I encourage you to work, Chris, all you want and have him meet with you in any crisis. Direct those to Jill. Um, and I, uh, I'll see you when you get back. But um, seriously, if, if staff's available at your perusal, we have a lot of time to have these discussions. We'll have these on work sessions. We'll bring up any of the items. If you give them to me in advance, we'll staff them and be ready for the discussion. Um, but there's a, there's a lot more work to do. This is just the beginning. And again, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Barry. Wait a second. I have something I want to talk about. <laughs> you didn't think I was coming back. I was, I was rushing to get up there. <laughs> I know. I got it. So listen, I just wanted to, I just have a few things that sure. I want to speak about. And I think we all have really been pleasantly surprised by the emails and correspondence we've received from our citizens as we've been talking about the budget. 
And uh, clearly there was a lot of misunderstanding in some of the emails. But all of us are sharing in the cost of inflation and the way in which prices have gone up. Property insurance, I mean, the legislature had a special session to deal with property insurance. I'm not quite sure what they did, but my, my insurance has not gone down by any stretch. Um, so we're all feeling the effects of that. And I dare say that here in Pinellas County, our citizens are enjoying a, spe a specific quality of life that are the result of, the, of where we have shown our values by where we have put our money. And I think that's really something that's significant for us to remember. Because I can assure you that at the time, some of you may remember when the no-name no storm went marching through Pinellas County with tornadoes and floods and horrific sure winds. I was the deputy insurance commissioner at the time, and I will never forget driving commis uh, Commissioner uh, Gallagher around. He was our insurance commissioner at the time, and going into these neighborhoods that look like a war zone. Those are the things that you have to think about when you start talking about rolling back the millage rate and having the dollars needed to recover from that. Think Michael, think Ian, think if that were ever to happen here in Pinellas County, how devastated it would be for all of us. And the, the last point that I wanted to make was um, in another chapter for those of us that may be thinking of rowing back the millage rate, and I am not one of them, if there was one thing I learned when it was Governor Jeb Bush, if some of you can believe that, that appointed me to the uh, State Tax Reform Commission. And I sat there with a group of some of the most intelligent and respected CEOs and economists in the state at that time. And one of the most irresponsible things that you can do when you're talking about public tax policy is rolling back the millage rate. It is incredibly regressive, and it takes decades to recover from it once you do it. And so I will never forget that because the business community made dozens of examples of what happens when you do that, and it really stuck with me. So I think, again, we, when we, we all worked really hard to get here. And when we were elected and we were sworn in, we all took an oath to protect and defend our county and our citizens. And we have an obligation to do the right thing to ensure that we are able to continue supporting those things that have given us the quality of life that everyone has come to love, expect, and want to come here and live and work and play. So I'm getting off my soapbox now, but I think it's really, really important to remember why we're here and the important work that we have to do. It isn't easy by any stretch, and it takes a long time to really absorb the kind of budget that we're going to be voting on. It is huge, but look at the responsibilities that we have that we're supposed to be taking care of. I, for one, am not going to think about rolling anything back on our sheriff's budget. I find him to be an incredible leader who understands what it takes to put a department like his together. And I also understand what it takes to get up every morning, leave your family, put on a uniform, a badge, and a gun, and not know if you're coming home. That is an incredible burden, not only on the individual, but the families that have to deal with that. So I ask you to think about those things, and I also ask you to think about, especially this is for you, Commissioner Eggers, because you make that point not only here, but at Forward Pinellas. What, come back when we have that discussion and give us a list of those things that you would be willing to give up to provide to our citizens to be able to do a rollback. 
I, I would really be very interested in everyone's thoughts about that because we're not here passing frivolous budgets. I mean, everything we do has almost a direct daily impact on the lives of our citizens. Amen, I'm done. You can go now. That concludes my report. Okay, <laughs> good. Thank you. We can't buy her a can of women yet. What? Did you no, say I'm just something saying snarky? If we get hit by a hurricane, it's Dave's fault. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! That's it's four out there churning. Took out of that. <laughs> There's four storms out there churning. There are four storms churning. Oh. In the Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've had the county mm -hmm. administrator's report, and now we are on. Fifty-five. Madam Chair, I have ballots for item fifty-five. Oh, great. Thank you. I was there. I'll tell you. What a awesome thing. You have on your It was four storms down. There's not allowed to be a storm this next week, please. Oh, you got it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Does anybody have any comments about these three folks? That they want to share? <laughs> no. Okay. You can hit the lights. You. Did you have a comment, Commissioner Eggers? No. All right. You're welcome. You can sing it in half because listen, when those tornadoes came through Chicago, I was looking. Because I looked at it this morning and I only saw Don out in the far east. Carolyn. Um, there's a tie, so we'll need to vote again um, between Mayor Dave Gaddis and Mayor Tyler Payne. I've received three votes for each of them. Aren't they four? Oh, may just. So what happens if there's a tie? Again? What if there's a tie again? We, we have to keep voting. Oh. Somebody Can we wait till next month when we have an odd number of people here? That would break the tie. It would break the tie, but we have a board meeting coming up on Thursday. Yeah, are we allowed to? Christmas tree, 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 Christmas tree,
Do you have ballots for that, Darwin? I do have ballots for that, but I... approval of the two uh, eligible applicants, right. uh, Miles Kroom and Cynthia Grizzle. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Done. 57. This is your Charter Review Commission, um, and you see under uh, commission appointments, you have one. You have two commissioners that submitted. Correct? Kevin? <laughs> Come on. I tell them, don't play games on your computers. <laughs> it gets long, though. Um, so, it, correct, they have two commissioners and one vote. For those two, so, right? Each commissioner has an individual appointee yeah. for the public appointees. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, there's, you have to vote for one of the vote for? Oh, I see. I see. I'm like. Let's see where this goes. We need. What a, this what we a, have to wait. What a meeting for <laughs> Commissioner <laughs> Peters to miss. This is, is our next meeting. <laughs> so you could do that. I was going to say, all each one of us get to appoint somebody. How do we? Right. I, but I get it. You I do, get it. but. No, I, I get it. You just have to listen. It's, yeah. it's late. It's five. Then each. each Constitutional yeah. gets it gets yeah. to be on it. It's just yeah. it's the way it's set up by statute. The board has selected Commissioner Eggers. Congratulations. Thank you, yeah. Thank you everybody. Appreciate that. Hey Dave, don't let us down. What's that? Don't let us down. I will. Um the, the next item on, sorry, Madam Chair, the next item on number 57 is um, I'd request a verbal vote. It's um, the three appointments for Pinellas Delegation, Constitutional Officer, and Municipal Elected Official. Move approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Number 58. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Well, don't yeah, don't we have 59. another vote? You, you have another vote. Yeah. We're still on the charter. Oh. Yeah. 57, confirmation of individual nominations. Um, would, we can also do a verbal vote. I would move approval of the individual nominations appointees by the individual seven commissioners. I'll second that. Thank you, Commissioner. We want to deliberate justice's pick. Just kidding. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Open the door, my friend. Open the door. <laughs> for the vote. He didn't mean that. Of course I didn't. Aye. 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 And last piece is the public, correct? Yeah, and then we have a Please. public at large. Yes, and I have ballots for that. <laughs> Commissioner Eggers, did you want to make any comments about these? Don't be a smart aleck. <laughs> <laughs> Just at a, at a point we do have, since with Commissioner Latvala's appointment of Mr. Ox, there is a, a law partner of his, so... Just if you were curious about balancing out geography or profession or anything else like that. Does that create a conflict of any kind? Because it's not information related to me. Well, it might within the firm. That would be their issue uh, to, to I know, but. Up. I'm not worried about that as much as just balancing out representation. Yeah. I'm holding everybody up. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> well, let's just lie. We're going to vote again, so. Is this a simple majority? How are we, how is this determined? A simple majority for any one person would elect. I think we need to see what the ballots are going to show. I think that you all can choose to, to decide if one person has the most votes. You know, they would be selected because it's, I'm not going to try to presume, but we'll need to see what the numbers show. 
my point is, would you need to have at least three, or is if there's a whole bunch of twos and ones, and I know you want to wait, and that's fine, but. Let's see, we can see what we see. There's three votes for Todd Jennings, two votes for Christopher Ryan, one vote for Virginia Lamberton, three votes for Lindsey Grove, two for Jim Parent, and one for Shelby Brown. I guess the two threes get it. Sounds like you've got two points. threes, but I would suggest if it's the will of the commission to go ahead and, and approve those folks if that's your desire. So that's Lindsey Grove and Todd Jennings. Todd Jennings. Todd Jennings. Just Mr. Jennings is the law partner I was mentioning. That means anything to anybody. Yeah, I figured that. If it doesn't, then I'm fine with those two. Move approval of those two. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now where are we? That's it for the CRC. All right, we have now appoint two appointments to the Pinellas County Housing Finance Authority. Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, your eyes are so lovely. Christmas in July? Yeah. Listen, I love Hallmark. <laughs> so I have, yeah. I cheated out at one of the conference sessions with my earbuds in to look in at the most. <coughs> You know what? The board has selected Stephen Bauman, and there is, um, just one moment. John Pierce has three, so he would be at eight. What's up? He has three, she has two. Evelyn has one. It's not a majority, though. Mm -mm. We, we, have, we, have, we have two. between John Pierce and Pierce. So it looks like you have a majority for Stephen Bauman. And you have a tie between the second two. So I think you it would be appropriate to have a revote. Just on those two. Between the two. Mm -hmm. That would be my and that Pierce? would be my recommendation for you all to follow that. I think it's up to your discretion if that's how you wish to but that would be the logical Way to go to me is to have a revote between the two that came in second with a tie vote. Audrey and John. Who's the other? Ensign and Pierce. Mm -hmm. Audrey and John. Who's the tie between Audrey, Audrey and Henson and John Pierce? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Should I have so much paper here? I'll have to get another set of ballots. I thought I brought enough, but apparently I did not. If you all want to move on to another item, we can get some more ballots produced for this one so that you all can vote between the two that tied for a second. How place? about we try to do I have that? the ballots. Oh, Sorry, you do. You do. Sorry. I do have. Thank you. And this is going to be a vote between Audrey Henson and John Pierce. John Pierce.
it's tied again. <laughs> I vote fails. So move to defer. I, is this going to interfere That's with That's a good meeting? idea. Let's, let's defer that till our next meeting. You can still appoint Mr. Ballman. Yeah. Absolutely. You can make the one appointment, and I don't know if this will interfere with any meetings scheduled. Because our next meeting is, I believe, August the 1st. Correct. Right. Is that okay? Yeah. I just prefer to have a whole board when I'm voting on Bob. I understand that you see what happens here when you don't. It's going to be difficult. Okay. Um, 59. Item 59. Yeah, there. And Reappointments to the WorkNet Pinellas BBA Career Source Pinellas County Board of Directors, Commissioners as a whole. Um, move approval of those recommended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And now we are on item 60, County Commission New Business. Um, I do have a couple things that I'd just like to make sure we get done today since we're almost at that, or we're past the time when we should be adjourning. I uh, would like to get your approval on an appointment, on three appointments I made today to the Homeless Leadership Board, which was, uh, they were inadvertently left off of the list of the appointments that I made in January. And the folks that I have selected to be on that committee, which is a very important one uh, for the school board and for our kids especially, is Commissioner Flowers, uh, Commissioner Latvala, and um, Commissioner Peters. I had to think for a minute because she wasn't here. She isn't here, but she is vice chair, and I'm, I feel very confident that she won't be upset one bit to be on that very prestigious board. Do you need it's, a motion? I'm sorry? Do you need a motion what, on that? What board is that? It's the um, Pinellas County um, Homeless Leadership, leadership Health, 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 Health and Service. Human yeah. Service. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I get those two mixed up. It's the Health and Human Services Board. Thank you, Commissioner Latvala. Yes, ma'am. It's a combination of the school board, JWB, and the county commission which don't meet very often, meet three, maybe four times a year. And it'll be from now till January, and then Commissioner Peters will pick, potentially Commissioner Peters will pick whoever she desires at that time. Yes? Yep. Okay. And the other thing I want to make sure we cover, too. I think we need a vote, full vote on that. Do you need a motion on that, or is just a... No. I just Usually was trying to build consensus. Yeah. Oh, Do consensus is fine. Yeah. On committees? But the chair gets to make the appointments. Yeah. Yeah. Although you do all usually vote yeah, we on the, the list approval of those appointments. Do we have approval? Aye. 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 All in favor said aye, and so it passes. <laughs> 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 the other thing I wanted to cover was the replacement of the board members on fact since our illustrious commissioner. Flowers has moved on up the ladder, leaving a vacancy, which mm -hmm. I appointed Commissioner uh, Latvala to fill. But there is another vacant seat now, and I would like Commissioner Flowers to have an opportunity to make our recommendation, if you would allow. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to my colleagues. Um, I was serving on the um, FAC board for even number years. Commissioner Latvala was um, voted on at our recent meeting odd number of years. So now that I'm second vice president, I move up. I'm still on the board, but in an executive position, which leaves the even number of year individual um, spot vacant. Um, and so I would uh, like for my colleagues to support me in recommending that Commissioner Justice continue to serve in that even year year spot <laughs> that even your spot Move second. Approval. second okay all in favor aye. Aye. aye done thank you so madam chair what will need to happen is your office will just need to send a letter to ginger delegal's 
attention, stating that Commissioner Justice will um, was voted upon unanimously to serve um, for the even number year. I'm sure Tony so. is paying attention. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. All right. Uh, and quickly, does anyone else have new? I have new business items, but I will forego them until, you know, our workshop or whatever. I can go over them then and respect the time. Anybody else have anything they're burning to say? Are you going to take a vote on the Skyway resolutions? <coughs> oh, <laughs> I guess we have to. Even see, two, I see two of them there. Move approval of the Second. Two. Again. Yeah. Light it up. Any no discussion? Way. I'm not there saying a word. Approval. Light it up. Very worthy. Light it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 That was easy. Okay. We're done. Be we'll back at six. Okay. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I just really, on behalf of everybody here, to, uh, expressing our condolences to the Tarpon City and to Tarpon's Police Department up there for the loss of Major Michael Trill. Yeah. Uh, this past week, um, obviously, very devastating to the to the to the team up there, to the to the community. He is an amazing man and has done so much in the community up there, but even beyond that. So we're going to miss him. The funeral services are Saturday, this Saturday at Calvary at 11 a.m. Okay, and I would also like to mm -hmm. extend condolences and our greatest Just sympathies to Commissioner Before Peters and her family for the loss of her brother. I don't have any information on services, but I'm sure we'll get that here shortly, and when we do, we'll pass it along. All right. All right, no 20s. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. okay, then I will see you right back here at 6 o'clock for our public hearing. Thank you for your attention. It was a long day with a lot of activity. Thank you.
Hey, new services and tell them. Hey, everyone. We are back here at 6.02, I think, or 3, to start our public hearing. And without further ado, Barry. Um, let's go over to the clerk. Thank you. Um, agenda item number 61 is case number ZON 23-02. This is the second of two public oh, hearings to consider a proposal by Pinellas right County and the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport for a zoning change from Employment 1 to Pinellas County Airport on approximately 18.5 acres located at 13690 Stony Brook Drive in unincorporated Largo. Since this is a quasi-judicial hearing, all those individuals who wish to speak on this item must be sworn in. For those wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Signify by saying, I do. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right. Um, do we want a presentation from? No. Yeah. This is second here. Second. Commissioner Eggers <coughs> moves approval. Second by Commissioner Flowers. <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Did the board right. you got a vote on the vote oh, machine. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm Here's sorry. It up here. Please begin. Okay. Now it's working. It's still All right. And it's still showing up. Yeah. <coughs> Who is? Who is okay. me? And that motion is approved uh, unanimously. All right, now we are on to 62. Agenda item number 62 is case number FLU 23-01. This is a proposal by La Mirage Beauty Salon Incorporated for a land use change from residential office general to employment on approximately 3.3 acres located at 3720 and 3730 Tampa Road in Palm Harbor. Uh, this is also a companion item to number 63. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you, Madam Clerk. What is the pleasure of the board? See a brief presentation? Yeah. 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 A presentation? Okay, fine. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, good evening, uh, Glenn Bailey, zoning manager. I'm also, in addition to the future land use case, I'm also gonna present information on the companion zoning case as well, since they're interrelated and intertwined. So I don't know if you need to announce that. We can go ahead and do that. Okay. Agenda item number 63, which is the companion to 62, is case number ZON 23-01. This is a proposal by La Mirage Beauty Salon for a zoning change from general office to employment to with a development agreement allowing up to 23,314 square feet of building area for the uses permitted in the employment two zone, except those specifically prohibited by the development agreement and at a building height as allowed by the employment two zone and terminating a 2014 deed restriction that limits building area to 14,690 square feet on approximately 3.3 acres located at 3720 and 3730 Tampa Road in Palm Harbor. Since this is a quasi-judicial hearing, all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. For those wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Signify by saying I do. I do. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk, and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay. So the subject property in these two cases is 3.3 acres, uh, 3720 and 3730 Tampa Road in Palm Harbor. That's um, south side of Tampa Road between Memorial and Booth Road and US 19. It's a future land use map amendment from Residence Office General to Employment and a zoning atlas amendment from General Office to Employment too. It also includes a development agreement that has size and use limitations. The existing use is a beauty salon and an office. It's two different parcels. Uh, beauty salon is on the south parcel, the office is on the north parcel. Proposed use has not been specified. You see um, basically an aerial of the subject property in red. This is the upland acreage, the upland area of these two parcels. The parcel is actually larger than this, but it's not proposing to change any of the conservation designations, preservation, the wetlands on this property. 
So you see it's uh, south side of Tampa Road, you see McMullen Booth Road intersection to the southwest. And it's surrounded by multifamily apartments, um, assisted living <coughs> facilities is um, right here. This area here is offices, medical offices, and the rest of it is single family attached, and single family detached residential. And the future land use map event on the left is the current ROG in purple. On the right would be proposed employment. Um, you notice that there are no other employment designations on this map. The closest employment designation is approximately two miles to the east, which is the Lockheed Martin property along Tampa Road near Oldsmar. Uh, the yellow, surrounding yellow uh, colors are residential, and the purple is office, the medical office is here, and the green is the preservation, the um, floodways, the various wetlands and uh, features like that, and this is uh, Lake St. George itself in the, in the blue. With the zoning atlas on the left is the current GO general office. You see the PC preservation conservation surrounding wetlands there. The RPD is residential plan development surrounding it. That's your apartments and your other residential uses. And the office is in uh, the medical office you can see to the southwest. Uh, the uh, proposed E2, again, is uh, not near any other E2. This would, in fact, be the first time E2 would ever be designated on Tampa Road, anywhere on Tampa Road. Here we see subject property. This is the, the beauty salon um, building on the south property. It's another view of it uh, on the left. On the right is the office building, and you see Tampa Road to the, to the adjacent to that building as well. Some additional information, the current residential office general land use allows residential office, personal services, light res, res, uh, research and development, manufacturing, 15 residential units per acre, 0 0.5 floor area ratio. Proposed E land use employment uh, is, allows R&D, manufacturing, warehouse distribution, uh, more intensive uses in general. Does not allow residential and the floor area ratio, so it will allow for larger buildings than the ROG. And the potential traffic impacts of 60 fewer trips daily, so employment actually has fewer trips than office. Just some information on the zoning. The current office zoning allows the full range of office uses, general, general office, medical office, uh, maximum building height is 75 feet. It's modified by the deed restrictions that were put in place under past development agreements. Proposed E2 zoning allows office uh, re research development, manufacturing warehouse, retail, a very large, wide variety of uses. Uh, maximum building height, again, is 75 feet, and the uses that are allowed would be modified by the proposed development agreement. <coughs> this site has a long history. It was part of um, a master plan development, and it, used, it was originally a church. It was built in the late 1980s. 76% uh, of development rights were transferred off of this property to other parts of the master plan. So it only has 24% of development potential remaining on this property. Uh, church building redeveloped into a beauty salon uh, since that time. And it was first amended, land use and zoning amendments in 1999, also a development agreement at that time that changed it from residential to limited office. Uh, allowed a building area of 10,000 plus square feet. And the second building was constructed in 2002, that's the offices on the north parcel. It went through um, a second land use amendment, zoning amendment, and development agreement in 2013, 2014. It went from limited office to general office, so it allowed more intense uses and a more intense building area. Uh, deed restrictions made the limitations permanent and they're still in effect today. Uh, no additional construction occurred after that hearing. So no, no construction is heard on this property or has been held on this property since 2002. The proposed development agreement would terminate the 2014 deed restrictions. It would increase the building area limitation to 23,314 square feet. And that's based on the higher floor area ratio allowance of the employment land use. It prohibits certain other uses allowed otherwise in E2 zones, such as contractors' yards, manufacturing, vehicle towing, repair, adult uses, uh, things like that. However, several new uses would be allowed that are not currently, including <coughs> retail uses, car wash, fitness center, brewery, kennel, um, warehousing, uh, commercial recreation, agriculture, things like that. New de deed restrictions would make those limitations permanent, and the wetlands would stay preservation and no concept plan. Importantly, no concept plan has been included. Also importantly, that Tampa Road is a designated scenic non-commercial corridor by the comprehensive plan. The intent of the plan is to preserve scenic nature and traffic capacity of scenic corridors and the low-density residential to preferred land use. 
non-residential land use may be applied if it's compatible with surrounding uses uh, and, and consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, scenic corridors are allowed to you know, mixed-use nodes at the major intersections. Uh, as you can see, um, Tapper Road at the intersection with Mullen Booth to the south, southwest, or southeast. In this case, such a property is surrounded by environmentally sensitive areas and residential uses, and it's not within one of those mixed nodes. It's recommendational land use. Uh, it's the subject property is located, again, along the scenic non-commercial corridor, surrounded by environmentally sensitive and residential uses. It would allow additional intensity of non-residential uses on this property. It will be the third time that development intensity has been increased on this property since 1999. It's inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. Staff recommends denial, and the local planning agency recommends denial of six to one vote. The zoning case, proposed zoning amendment from general office to E2 and the development agreement. Again, same reasons that staff recommending denial. Existing uh, zoning provides an opportunity for reasonable uses of the land that are more appropriate with the property's locational characteristics. And staff recommends denial, and the local planning agency also recommends denial by six to one votes. So, if you have any additional <coughs> questions, also have a large, larger scale maps if you'd like to see the larger area surrounding the subject property. Any questions, comments, Commissioner Justice? Thank you. Um, I just was wanted to. It's in the it's in the presentation. I just want to confirm. There's no proposal as far as use of the property if land use was approved? No specific proposal. Okay. No. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Do we know why the um, zoning has changed so many times? It's allowed increases in uses over time and use development potential. Um, it's small step incremental increases each time. Originally it was a church which is allowed in a residential district. Mm -hmm. The first time they changed it to a limited office district, which allowed the salon, which went into place. I guess they thought they might want to add additional uses to the property. So in 2013, it was changed from limited office to general office, which allows a bigger building again and a few more additional uses as well. But they never built anything after that second approval. So it sounds like there's been a lot of interest in this particular piece of property, right. but they haven't, for whatever reason, been able to I'm figure sure. out how to work with us, maybe? I don't know. I'm sure the applicant has some thoughts on that. Um, they say <laughs> oh, they I'll need be a, happy to ask. So. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, Commissioner Eggers. On the transfer of density and the, from the, in the beginning, mm -hmm. it sounded like that, and again, I'm get sensitive to this because we're talking about transfer of density rights at um, right. Forward Pinellas, and to me, I always worry about that, thinking that, down the road, you know, you can always go back on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea, obviously, behind it is to be able to transfer those rights somewhere else and then right. that leaves that property, which you would otherwise think should deserve more, with less because it's moved its, its rights elsewhere. That's exactly the case in, for the subject property. And the only way to increase that building size is to increase the intensity that's allowed by the land use. Mm -hmm. That's why it's went from residential to re, um, residential office, office limited and residential office general and now employment allows one of the highest floor yeah. ratios that we have okay i think it's kind of circumventing uh, that, what the that was, that was a really good point that you made because i got that yeah. really good point that you made right. so they're circumventing i mean i don't mean they but it i mean to me it sounds like the spirit of what was originally intended right and then then the property has had its limitations and restrictions since correct and they've still been able to right. i don't mean this when i say they i'm not talking about this one but they've been able to up that intensity a little bit anyway they have and they still have some intensity rights that they have not used and so is the point that it's inconsistent with the surrounding neighborhoods correct the environmental uh surrounding environmental the sensitive lands plan. the surrounding uh, residential uses and particularly the fact that it's on a scenic non-commercial corridor uh -huh. That Mullen Booth Road, the scenic quarter. We have a lot of them. Belcher Road, that's how, you know, it's been a great tool in the past to keep uses that are very intense off those corridors. All right. Any questions? Com Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. So if, if, if we denied this, is there anything preventing the applicant from coming back with a site plan and reapplying? It would be six months later for them to be able to come back. 
I believe that's six months. Six right. months. Okay. And then they have to pay all the additional fees Correct. again, right? Correct. And just curious, what are those fees? Uh, it's around three thousand. Uh, it's around forty-five hundred total. Forty-five hundred. That includes the development agreement and the land use and zoning changes. Okay. Um, but they could come in with site plan to build the additional square footage that was allowed after the last time they came up and got approval in 2013, which they have not done. And for all of these different zoning um, iterations that we've been through over the last several years, is it the same owner? It's the same owner as far as I know, yes. It's the same owner. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? <coughs> Anybody? Anybody? No one? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now shall we hear from the applicant? Apparently. 20 minutes. Hello. 20? Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Chair and Commissioners, my name is Todd Pressman, 202nd Avenue South, number 451 St. Petersburg. Pleasure to be here this evening. A lot of good questions that I'll be happy to answer for you. Uh, this is 3.3 uh, acres as presented. I do want to tell you that Mr. Bailey's been great to work with as always. He's been very helpful and he's been able to help us usher through what we can here even though we have a difference of opinion. Um, and he's briefed you pretty well on it. Uh, you're aware the location is in Palm Harbor and the site is on Tampa Road as noted here. Uh, this is the major McMullen Booth intersection. Uh, Tampa Road is a very busy road between 38,500 to 43,480 trips per day. It's a major, obviously a major arterial north part of the county. This site is composed of two parcels, one and two. Uh, Glenn showed you some photos of the site that uh, ha has been an active site. Future land use he's shown you as well, which mirrors uh, office development just a stone's throw on Tampa Road. The site again here, major medical and office, uh, just a stone's throw. This is a uh, aerial of that uh, nearby location, which you can see the intensity. And this is another photo of that intensity, which is very close to the site. Zoning is GO, as Jen has indicated. Now, critical point, commissioners, is that yes, it's correct. There has been a transfer density from this property, but this is a maligned and difficult property. What and does quite, that mean? I'll show you, because these white lines all show you that there are significant conservation and drainage easements on the property. You can see that it accommodates and takes over a lot of the property. It is a difficult property in that sense. It is maligned. It has to deal with these difficulties. That's a major problem. The second problem, and what we tried to do here tonight, which is out of the status quo, it's not something that you would usually see, is that we've had to thread a needle on square footage. Because as, and noting along with these difficulties that at least 34% of the property is wetlands, the property has been marketed for four years by Mark Gagne. He's a very prominent real estate uh, person in North County. And they have tried to navigate and get interest in this property for four <coughs> years, which has not been successful. And there's one reason, and one reason only. I'm not a real estate guy. That's because there's not enough square footage. I'm going to say again, we're well aware that there was a transfer density, but we're here with a property that has other major difficulties. And what we're trying to do is work through, not saying this in bad word, bureaucracy and how the different codes work that allow certain things and don't allow other things, which I'll talk a little bit more about, to try and make this property viable and usable for what the interest has been, which has been office. What is they marketed at? Do you know the price? I have absolutely no idea. No okay. Idea. Does your, does your client know? Um, uh, Olga wanted to be here this evening, but she uh, was not feeling well, and she went to the doctor. I'm not sure. I think she might have gone to the hospital, but I did ask her to be here this evening. I spoke with her this morning. She was not feeling well. So I'm, I'm sorry I can't answer that question for you. But they've been very aggressive to try and get the property. Olga, or her husband, died a few years ago. Um, she has been running the beauty salon, which I handled the rezoning, I don't know, some 15, 20 years ago. And she's tired. She's tired of running it. It's a very labor-intensive business, and she wants to sell the property. So we're trying to do the best that we can for her. That's the best answer I can give you. So what we chose to do was we chose to go with E2 zoning and E future land use category, because that gets us up to a floor area ratio of 0.65. It gets us the square footage 
that the property has to be at per Mr. Gagne and for what interest he's had in the property because <laughs> it is not viable without it. I'm going to say again, we recognize that there was a transfer density, but there are other issues going here. Now, the, the staff, Mr. Bailey, who always do a great job, they made a suggestion about going with a different category, LI. The difficulty with LI is that it doesn't allow general office. It allows the square footage, but not the, not the office space. And that's part of the elements that we bump up against to try and make this property very viable. Again, what we've done here is thread a needle. So what we chose to do was put together, put together a development agreement, which we more or less backed into or tried to back into the E2 category as a custom category. So what we did was we looked at all the uses that we felt would not be appropriate and excised them from those categories. We think we did a pretty good job with that because again, we're trying to get to a point where this is a property that's viable and is responsive to what the demand has been. So when you look at those, kind, those categories and the requirements or the parameters or the directives, you see that under E, office is included, personal service office is included, support uses are included, locational characteristics, these areas should be conveniently located to arterial highways, which I've shown you. Tampa Road is a major arterial highway with a lot of traffic. E, future land use with good access to transportation, utility facilities, major collector arterial, which I've shown you this, this, this property is. Under E, employment, the purpose is to depict those areas of the county that are now developed or appropriate to be developed with a broad range of employment uses, which includes office. It does include retail, office support, and we've excised the uses that we felt were not appropriate. E2, employment district, really doesn't have, or in terms of for general services, there's really no definition for general services as I looked it up. When you look at comp plan policies, future land use goal one, provide a variety of land use character areas to meet the needs of a diverse population support. Well, we know up in North County, office use and medical use and general office use is uh, desired. Uh, it has a good foothold up there. It's a good viable use. Promote a balanced relationship between the built and natural environment. This would do that. We're still respecting, as Glenn said, all the conservation easements and wetland easements are not going to be moved into. And um, establish future land use code categories that respond to the unique challenges of infill and redevelopment. And that's precisely what this proposal does, in our opinion. Like I said, it's not an easy one. We've had the thread and needle. We tried to put together and back into a proposal that we felt meet, meets the objectives and policies of the comp plan. Maintain a land development code that responds to unique challenges of infill. Consider a creative regulatory solution to support redevelopment. Provide land supportive of office and industrial uses to support target industries, broaden the range of employment. This may not be specifically a target industry, but it is a higher paid industry, which is of an interest to the county. Include development standards in, de in the development code to enable adaptive reuse of existing, it does refer to industrial commercial buildings, but there's a push towards trying to work towards adaption and working towards solutions of properties that maybe have difficulties or are located in correct areas of the county, which I've shown you. So in summary, as I've indicated, the site is tremendously impacted by conservation easements and wetlands. We tried to create a custom zoning, locate a major arterial, and we do feel that we meet a number or quite a few of the comp plan and zoning policies. So with that, we appreciate your attention. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions, commissioners? Yeah, and he can reserve that time. Stop it. Yeah. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. So perhaps I'm missing it, and I apologize, but the letter from the realtor gave deference to um, medical persons who were in the medical field potentially being interested in this property. Those are the people that... Um, have shown some interest. The owner of this property, is there a business that has specifically come to her and said, we'd like this property for whatever, if we could get the zoning changed? Or, or are you just attempting to get a zoning change because you want to make it more palatable for sale for the owner? The critical factor is square footage. And that's why we're 
pushed into a corner for the categories that we have tonight. The interest from 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 a number of persons has been for office use and medical use, but at a higher square footage that can carry the property uh, economically. That's that's a critical issue. So to answer your question directly, there is no one person or entity that has submitted a letter of intent, but has shown great interest depending how the property can be moved forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else? Commissioners? I think that's it. Doesn't seem to be any more questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. What is the pleasure of the board? Glenn, could you come up? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? I just wanted to ask Glenn. That's another question for Glenn. Sure. So, um, aside from the fact that they've not brought any any plans to you, uh, uh, he mentioned a development agreement. Mm -hmm. Is that all the details of that been discussed with you? I mean, we discussed it. He presented what uses he thought were less palatable, <laughs> but didn't really. We did not opine on those and go into great detail because. We were so opposed to the employment land use being put on this property. How long is a development agreement good for? Generally five years. Some go a little longer, but generally five years. And they, they, and they include deed restrictions. And those deed restrictions are perpetual, and they basically make the specific conditions of the development agreement perpetual. There is one right now on it from 2014 when you approved the for last how time. Long? It's perpetual. And the development Forever? agreement itself is expired. But the deed restrictions are there until you remove them. Okay. And part of this Correct. development agreement that's proposed tonight would remove those and then add new ones, uh, add the, provide an avenue to add new ones in the future before building permits are issued. I think what Garland's saying is it would terminate what I'm assuming is a more restrictive Correct. deed restriction and put in its place a less restrictive one yep. in accordance yes. with the approval being requested. It would allow a larger building. More square footage. More square footage. It would. Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Has there been any any comment or feedback or input from the public and surrounding there, the homeowners or anything? We have not received any correspondence from surrounding property owners. Uh, we notice the property owners. There's a large apartment complex is next door, so we don't notice the tenants. So the owners themselves, there's only a few people there. They have not provide any comments on this. If you would like to see the scenic corridor map, I do have that here. If you'd like to see that. Um, so from the, from the tenants that you have next door, have there been a lot of complaints about what's been going on with this property? I have not heard any complaints, no. no. All right, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with the staff recommendation unless we had more specificity from the applicant on what their intention were, but I don't want to necessarily put them in a position of having to start all over from scratch. So uh, what's what's the proper framing to get us a position where they could go back to work with staff and um, bring some specificity? You could move to deny without prejudice, and that basically is without prejudice to reapply within that same six month period. And I, I can't answer the question as to fees that might be might be or not be involved. But they would be allowed to reapply within that six month window. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. What do you mean you can't answer yeah, whether staff we, would be involved? I, I, fee, I can't answer whether there would be additional fees for it, something like that. It would be a new case. Could we waive the fees for this one particular applicant? You could, you know, another thing you could do, you could table something like this, reschedule it to give time to work something out. Um, and, and let me say, you know, part of the fees that applicants see are for noticing these things, which are hard costs that the county would have to absorb. Right. So it, oftentimes when you all will continue something, if the intent is to try to give staff and the applicant an opportunity to work things out, you tend to uh, continue to a date certain. There's been some litigation on that, but I do believe we got the um, appropriate, you know, statute in place to allow that to continue happening so that we don't have to re-notice things. Um, I don't know what a preferable date for that might be. I know you have budget hearings and some things coming up, so maybe, you know, out beyond that if that was a preference because certainly you would want to have time for staff to... But if we tabled it, we move to table, 
then there is they can go back to work right now without additional fees if we're going to have to re-notice it, I'm assuming we're going to push, and I'd have to ask Glenn how we handle that. But again, if you don't continue to a date certain, it has to be re-advertised, right. and those are hard costs that, that, that somebody has to pay. Generally, if the county continues a case, we do not recharge. If they ask for a continuance, we do recharge. Um, but the question would yeah. be, would it have to go back to the DRC and the LPA and all that? So, so it would, it would take a, a number time. of months. So it would be to better to do it to a date certain. Uh, hold on, hold on one minute, please. I, I, I just can't hear too much. No, but, but Todd, come up here, please. Yep. Do you know what the will of the applicant is in terms of moving this forward and extending it for a period of time certain to work things out? We're, we're always happy to work with the staff and work with the commission, absolutely. Do you have a recommendation for how long that might take? And commissioners, I think you're months. asking for a site plan. Is that um, or what, what are you specifically asking for that staff would work on? I only say that because the, is the applicant willing to, to move to a, a, a what they're actually proposing for the land and they don't have anything yet? That could take some period of time. With, with all due respect, Ms. Burton, um, Glenn and I have had some discussions about a different way to bring the categories forward. Um, and I think that could be a positive way to go. So. That would be my thought. Um, and as a date certain, this is, I would say three months. The soonest we can get the development review committee would be November. Oh, the you want to go away? It would be December. We, it would have to restart. If you change, we have to go back to DRC. If you change a request okay. from employment to something else, okay. it would have to go back to the DRC. Yeah. Okay. And the LPA. That's fine. So November, Wh whatever we need to do. November, December. So be the soonest it could go, get back here. January. August deadline, October, DRC, it would be December, I think. That's why I said November, I'd have December. to check my, well, my let's, calendar. Let's make it January. Oh, it will be six months. Okay. 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 January. So ja with, with, with uh, all due respect, we'd ask your consideration no. for January. I don't know we, don't have, we a have a calendar for We don't January. have a calendar for January. That's the problem. Yeah. Y you could deny without prejudice, which would send this back to... Well, well, I'm sorry, can we do December and, if necessary, continue it for a month? I mean, we could continue it again, couldn't we? We could. December okay. 12th is the December meeting. Okay. Right. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I certainly would be in support of doing that. Um, I think the intent here is to come to some type of positive resolution mm -hmm. for both the county as well as the, the young lady who is attempting to try to do something with the property that she herself can no longer um, uh, oversee or desire to no longer oversee and I have to applaud her for doing that you know trying to figure out a way so I certainly would be in support of not trying to have them incur an additional 4500 or so for fees if we could tentatively um, give it that date certain of the December 12th and if we need to move it past that point at that time then we can but um, especially if uh, Glenn and Mr. Pressman are saying that they they may have somewhere to meet in the middle mm -hmm. to get this resolved. Okay. Is that good? Rather than just telling her no Everybody for today. Good? Yeah, and that would be without fees, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And there does need to be a, a motion and approval to that effect. I would move that we, um, we continue this hearing proceeding for December 12th. Um, for reconsideration and presentation of an updated plan. plan. And let me interject one thing before you have yes. a vote. Uh, right, can you, you hold on just one, Joel, can you hold on for just one minute, please? Because mm -hmm. we have a motion and a second. So can you just let her finish what the motion is and then you can? Well, I wanted to suggest a modification to the motion. I am open to the modification to, of the motion. Okay. You're currently talking about item number 62. It mm -hmm. is a companion to item number 63, so you may wish to have your motion cover both. My cases. motion will cover items number 62 and 63 as it relates to moving the continuation, as it relates to continuing the discussion on items number 62 and 63 for a date certain of December 12th. Second. Excellent. And it's been seconded by Commissioner Latvell, Commissioner yeah. Eggers. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, I do respect Mark as a, as a realtor. I just, when 14,000 square feet doesn't work, 
I think, for the price that they're asking. I think that needs to be finished because it will work for somebody <laughs> at the price that they're at, if the price is reasonable and, and priced accordingly. So if they're asking for this much but the land doesn't justify it, that's, that's you know, they may have to adjust the price. Just, just saying. Appreciate the feedback. Thank you. All right. Now yeah. we are postured for a vote. We have a motion and a second. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome, Mr. Pressman. Can you we open? Okay, so here open. we go. Until Please the, cast the your votes. Gift. All right, that has been approved unanimously, and am I assuming that 63 is taken care of? Yes, yeah, 62 and 63 is ma'am. 63 as well, so we're yep. done with that as yep. well? Yes, 64. Okay, now we are on to item 64. 64 agenda item 64 is case number CP 23-01. This is the first of two public hearings to consider a proposal by Pinellas County Housing and Community Development Department for an amendment to the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use Map Category Descriptions Rules Part 1 Future Land Use Map Category Descriptions to add the Mixed Use Corridor Supporting Neighborhood Park mixed-use corridor supporting local trade and mixed-use corridor primary commerce future land use map designations to facilitate implementation of the Lelman form base code and amending the unincorporated Pinellas County future land use map legend. This item is companion to item 65. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right, and before we get to commission comments or motions or whatever, we have a con constituent who would like to speak, Jeremy Heath. Do you want to do presentation first, or you want a presentation? Please come for, would, would you like to see the presentation first, Mr. Presentation, Heath? That's just fine. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, let's see the presentation first. Thank you, Commissioner. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. You're Ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Scott Swearingen, and I'm the Long Range Planning Manager for the county. The item before you, I'm going, actually going to present on the next two items before you, and that would be the CP2301 and FLU23-4. They're companion items. Okay, and these two items um, are very much centered in land use. It's a comprehensive plan and a future land use map. And they're important um, because they really set up and provide the foundation for adoption of the Leoman form based code, which is something that we've been working on for a while uh, with the Leoman community, the Community Development Agency, and um, Mr. Heath and the um, Citizens Advisory uh, Committee as well. The first case, CP2301 would amend the comprehensive plan to establish three new uh, mixed-use corridor designations um, in, in the comprehensive plan. And then the next case, the FLU 23-4, would take those three new designations and apply them to the future land use map for their respective areas within the Leoman CRA. And those designations are the mixed-use corridor supporting neighborhood park, mixed use corridor supporting local trade, and the mixed use corridor primary commerce designations. Those would be the three new designations that would go in the plan and subsequently be put on the future land use map. Okay. Uh, just if you'll indulge me just really quickly, I think it's important to note um, there are two additional cases um, that are kind of packaged with all of this. Those would come to you at a subsequent date, and they're also important to adopting the form based code. LDR 2301 is actually um, uh, amending the land development code to have the form based code included within, and then subsequently would be an amendment to the zoning atlas that would place the zoning districts of that uh, form based code onto the zoning atlas. And again, those are to be heard subsequent to the comprehensive plan and the land use um, cases should they be approved this evening or should they continue forward this evening. The map before you um, shows the confines of the Leoman Community Re Re Redevelopment Area, the CRA. <clears throat> the area in blue 
is the neighborhood park. Um, it would be the, the um, mixed use corridor supporting neighborhood park designation and that's primarily along 54th Avenue uh, North. The local trade um, designation is the purple which is primarily uh, along um, along Haynes, along the most of Haynes Road. And then finally that commerce designation is the area in orange which is primarily along 34th Street North and with this area that we kind of that we call uh, the triangle of 54th Avenue North, 28th Street North, and Haynes Avenue. It's kind of just to the east or just to the west of that 54th um, that intersection or that interchange rather with um, I-275. And those are the areas that are within uh, the CRA that would be um, that, that, that are a part of this amendment. The future land use map um, that for C CP 23-01, um, so amending the comprehensive plan, and that amendment would be a text amendment that goes into the future land use map category description of rules. It establishes those three new mixed use corridor designations, and it includes, um, like the other uh, designations and other categories and future land use element, um, purpose statement, use location characteristics, um, and development standards like floor area ratio maximums. So that would all be established first and foremost in the comprehensive plan. We have the, with the neighborhood uh, park and the um, local trade, um, those, those two designations are characterized primarily by low to mid-rise um, street-oriented buildings um, with activated retail and public spaces served by wider sidewalks and pedestrian amenities with allowing a maximum 1.0 FAR for non-residential uses and then an overall maximum FAR would, of 1.5 would be permitted if a project was to include a minimum amount of residential uses within that project. And that's because we would like to incentivize residential and mixed use projects. So if you incorporate residential in the project, then you can achieve an overall maximum uh, project FAR, if you will. If it's simply non-residential uses, then you would be limited to the 1.0 FAR. Similarly, the uh, mixed-use corridor primary commerce designation is also characterized low to mid-rise buildings may be a little bit larger in scale, uh, screen parking and reduced shared access points, primary building um, entrances, accesses kind of to the street level, direct access to the street, with a maximum 1.2 FAR for non-residential uses solely, and then an overall project FAR again to a 2.0 if a project is to incorporate a minimum amount of residential uses within and again, the same reason to incentivize residential within a project. <clears throat> so the designations have been prepared specific to areas within the Lumen CRA. We worked with the CRA and the CAC <coughs> and the residents in order to try and establish these areas. What are the primary corridors that we're looking at at this point? Um, they'll be added to the future land use map under this companion item that is the second one in the list of FLU 2304. And these, again, these land use designations are, um, they're necessary to the support the proposed uh, Lima Informed Based Code. So moving to the second of the two items, the land use amendment would cover um, a total of approximately 168.63 acres within the Lima CRA. 36.5 acres would be designated with that neighborhood park area that I showed you on the map. 38.71 acres with the local trade area, primarily along uh, Haynes Road corridor. And then finally, the remainder 93 plus acres would be that commerce designation, which is primarily along 34th Street North slash US 19. And that would comprise those 168.63 acres in the CRA. <laughs> the map um, before you um, outlines um, those designated areas. Um, so you see 54th Avenue, 34th Street, the Haynes Corridor. This is that triangle area I showed you. And the land use designations currently, there's a mix of them, primarily commercial generals and land use character. They're, they're busy corridors. There are primary corridors in the CRA. Those are the ones we wanted to tackle first um, and at this time. And so the change would simply bring those into, cohes into three cohesive new land use designations, which is important to when we're, in, when we're moving to a form-based code because we want to start to see a, um, an established cohesive character 
along these corridors where people start to really identify, I'm in Leelman, this is a corridor, this is an important corridor in Leelman, and you start to sort of see this cohesive development um, occurring. And so that would be how the changes would occur. That map amendment is intended to implement the CRA plan objectives. The CRA plan was adopted by this board initially in 2016 and then amended in 2019. And, to, and a few of the objectives included, which um, are supported by this, would be the focused development on the major corridors, as I explained, um, increase the quality housing options. So we're also incentivizing housing as well by having the additional FAR if you include residential in a project and allow for predictable development. VZV to form based code. The form based code helps to allow for more predictable development. We have one established in downtown Palm Harbor as well, and, and that's really helped us to really kind of understand the type of developments coming forward and to have that kind of character um, and form that, that, um, that is desired. It's corridor focused again on the corridors, and we are primarily staying out of the residential neighborhoods at this time. Um, this, we like to think of this as a first phase. Uh, if there's further interest in moving forward, we may find additional phases to um, expand upon um, these areas for the form based code within the CRA. And those new uh, mixed use corridor designations, again, support the new Leoman uh, form based code district that we're working towards. Yes, sir. So, so, Commissioner okay. Rogers. So, this is form based. So, the, the uses that are currently allowed, mm -hmm. for the most part, will be allowed. Most of the, in most of the districts, the uses that are currently allowed would be allowed to move forward, okay. correct. There are, it's not, the, there, the form based code and actually the, the land use designations, they, the land use designations broadly establish the uses. It's much more broad. You're kind of working at a higher level and you're tailoring it down with the form based code. So from the land use perspective, which is the two, um, the two uh, cases before you right now, a plethora of uses would be allowed, and then those are narrowed down through the form based code. It's kind of the way our land use and zoning works today as well. You have a broad range of, of uses that are permitted under the land use, and then as you get down to a granular level with the zoning, it starts to hone in um, those uses a little more. By and large, the uses that would be allowed in the future cases under the Leoman <laughs> form based code are uses that are currently allowed today. The code, per, the, the code gives more of an emphasis on form and building placement and character. And use is sort of secondary to that. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> I just want to ask a question. So for the maximum um, FAR that you're requesting, that would probably equate to no more than three stories, depending on the lot size. It, it really, depending on the lot size, that's a great point. Depending on the, obviously the large, if, if property assemblage can occur, then somebody could realize a taller building. My prediction is that you would not, maybe on 34th Street North, and again, and I'm just speculating at this point, if there were properties of significant size for this area, you might be able to realize something more in the five story realm. But I believe once you start including, when you're meeting your parking standards, your stormwater, right. your landscaping. Um, ingress you, and egress, yes. That yes, exactly. Sense. You're really starting to, that box starts to get smaller. Okay. We want to allow, you know, we want to give um, developers and property owners the ability to find creative solutions should they be able to. Maybe they vault drainage or find other, or, or structure parking um, and ways to find creative solutions to, to look to um, achieve those, you know, if they can get more, more, um, more building height, okay. that would be fine. Thank you. I want to follow, up, a follow up question on that. So form based, um, when you get into these corridors and I guess it, you, know, you just said something about five stories, which kind of made mm -hmm. me, so we, there's a lot of residential mm -hmm. behind it. So what kind of setbacks are we talking about? We have, I mean, I know mm -hmm. that's not, we haven't sure. addressed that yet, but are we, because that's a big deal. Well, I appreciate the question, and, and, and what I hope you'll see uh, moving forward to the form-based code, we actually have um, a, a part of the code that we call neighborhood manners, as opposed to, you know, you need to have good manners when you're, mm -hmm. when you're abutting residential development. So we require additional setbacks um, when you're abutting residential. We require, or require a stepped building height 
So you can have a certain limited building height to up to a certain point from a residential property. And as you get further away, you can start to step up that building height. And we also require um, things like fe you know screening uh, devices as well, that kind of it thing. It worries me about the kind of corridor is that they don't typically have a lot of depth to them. Correct, yes. So you're, so you're really going to be restricting the height in a lot of those cases. It, you just Absolutely. It's a real challenge in, in an area like this because you do have um, a number of properties, not so much on 34th Street North, but on like Haynes and on 54th, you have a lot of, um, the depth isn't that great in some of these properties. So that can be, you know, that can be an inhibiting factor to redevelopment. And is it intimidated by the fact that you're not including residential in there? Or is that another factor? I'm sorry, would you please repeat, Madam Chair? I don't know what I'm actually asking, but it's, are you, is that a result of not including the residential in there? Um, we include residential in all of the three um, land, uh, all the mixed use quarter land use designations, which would, trans which would translate into the form based code. So, residential is a permitted use. So, that is something, so somebody could come in with a proposal to do residential as well. And they would be allotted um, an additional. For um, mixed use as well? For mixed use, absolutely. When we encourage it through um, the way that we've crafted. Um, the land use and the form based code to encourage mixed use development. But with a higher floor area ratio, you'd be able to maybe get a little more height if you had. Yeah. So, so long as you can meet the other requirements right. for the parking the and stormwater, yeah. things like that. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Anybody over here? I'm good. No? Anybody over here? Commissioner Lovell? No? Anybody over here? Good. Okay. okay, I'm going to try and land this plane pretty quickly here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, but I, I think it's important um, as far as public engagement and outreach, uh, we have been working with the Citizen Advisory Committee for the Lillium and CRA uh, since 2022. We've been meeting with them regularly. They have provided great input and a lot of thought into, you know, the, the end product that we have to this point, and they have endorsed, um, they have endorsed these changes and they have endorsed a moving forward with adoption effect. And we have um, a gentleman here, former chair of the CAC, um, who has requested to, to speak in uh, favorably upon this applica these applications. We held a couple public open houses and we held them down at the Lehman Exchange, uh, convenient for the community. Um, they were advertised and mailed and signed as well. Um, we've reached out to stakeholder businesses. Um, we provided the document, the Lehman Form Race Code, for public to review and to make comment on, as well as the community, <laughs> as well as the CAC. And of course, our county department staff had reviewed as well. Public Works Department, Building Development Review Services, they provided us comment and a lot of useful feedback. And then in the planning division, we fielded phone calls if they've come in and email inquiries, and when I believe we've responded to all so to this point. So let's wrap up with our recommendations um, regarding CP2301 to establish renew mixed use uh, corridor designations in the comprehensive plan. Staff finds that further implements the, the Lehman CRA plan itself. It's compatible with the mixed use quarter land use categories that are currently established in the plan and the comprehensive plan. Um, it supports the adoption of the Lehman Uniform Based Code, forthcoming, and it's consistent with our comprehensive plan. Both our development review committee and our local planning agency have recommended approval. This is a transmittal hearing. This is not um, an approval or an adoption hearing. It's just a, so that we can transmit these amendments to the state review agencies for their review. We anticipate coming back um, with everything kind of packaged up, neatly ready to go um, in uh, December, December 2023. I think we'll have kind of all four items ready for you. That's when we anticipate Famous coming. last words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to knock on this wood right here, and hopefully uh, that holds true. Um, so similar with the land, FLU 23-04, staff finds further implements of the human um, CRA plans compatible with the land use mix prevalent along the, these corridors and directly impacted by the amendment. Um, it consolidates these, the current land use designations into three cohesive designations uh, to bring greater development design compatibility, which is really kind of the hope for all this and the way that the regulations work. Uh, it supports adoption to the Lumen Form Based Code, and again, it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. And, and similar to the other item, Development Review Committee and Local Planning Agency recommend approval and with the same um, transmittal and adoption schedule as well. That concludes 
my presentation. And I'll tr I know that's a lot to unpack and it's a lot to take in and I'll be happy to try and answer any que further questions should you have. Commissioners? Just one quick question. Record. When you come back, uh, then you'll you'll give us enough of that, the, the, the setback information. We'll have a fee. I, I would, yes, I'd sir. Like to you have a visual before we go we off. We anticipate this. bringing the, the form-based code itself, um, which includes all the development regulations, um, in late October is our schedule to bring that before you for a first of two hearings. So you'll have two chances to look at that, and that would include all that information, sir. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anybody else? No. Very good. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Chair, if I could. Scott covered both 64 and 65. We did not allow our clerk to read in for the record, just the notification for 65. So if we could have her go ahead and do that now. Mm -hmm. Madam Jen Clerk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Agenda item number 65 is case number FLU 23-04. This is the first of two public hearings to consider a proposal by Pinellas County Housing and Community Development Department for land use change from commercial general employment, residential urban, residential medium, residential office limited, residential office general, institutional and transportation utility to mixed use corridor supporting neighborhood park on approximately 36.5 acres and from commercial general, residential low, residential urban, residential low medium, residential medium, and residential office general to mixed use corridor supporting local trade on approximately 38.71 acres and from commercial general employment, residential low, residential urban, residential low medium, residential medium, and residential office general to mixed use corridor primary commerce on approximately 93.42 acres for a total land use change on approximately 168.63 acres comprising various parcels within the Lelman Community Redevelopment Area. This is companion to item number 64. Public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication was received for filing. No correspondence was received by the clerk, and the matter was properly before the board to be heard. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. Jeremy, guess what? It's your turn, finally. Mm -hmm. I apologize. No problem. Good evening, everybody. Hey. Um, you might want to speak up just a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, so, <laughs> As we just demonstrated, this is not necessarily the most sexy sounding uh, thing. However, I can say that we have worked very hard uh, to thoughtfully include um, the proper corridors and the right plan for, as Commissioner Eggers uh, pointed out, the most appropriate and uniform uh, future for Lelman. Um, oh, Jeremy, one yes. moment. When you say we, Please indicate who you're referring to, number one. And number two, you didn't state your name and address. And Boy, who I'm you're representing left and right and here. <laughs> so my name is Jeremy Heath. I am a uh, Lelman CRA Advisory Committee member. And when I'm referring to we, I'm uh, talking specifically about the other advisory members as well as Pinellas County staff. Perfect. Um, thank you. I would like to thank, uh, man, the, the, it's my, my Oscar speech. <laughs> Evan Johnson, Chris Moore, uh, Carol Scott, uh, they, were, they were very involved and, and worked closely with the community, so I, I would like to thank them for, for all their efforts. Um, however, uh, I stood before you guys, I believe, in March um, about the form-based code and some of the things that I was hoping that staff would consider. And one of the things that was left out of uh, the final draft that would, would be voted on um, is an amendment to some of the current county regulations as it relates to ADUs, um, auxiliary dwelling units. My understanding is the county currently allows for 750 square feet um, and one unit on an individual property as, as the current code allows. Um, our hope and vision and my understanding is this, uh, all of Pinellas County staff who, who worked on this agrees with me on this. Uh, we are hoping that eventually in the phase two that was alluded to, uh, we could perhaps extend that 750 square feet to 1,000 square feet and potentially even allow a second ADU. Uh, my understanding is the reason that this did not move forward is because it would conflict with other Pinellas County uh, zoning and code laws. Um, so I, although I understand why it was left out, I feel very, very strongly that Lelman in particular would thrive with more ADUs. And I would actually want to uh, point out 
Uh, a, a very good discussion that you guys had earlier just this afternoon um, on the 2024 budget. And some of your guys' opinions, understandably so, fall on certain sides of the aisle, and, and there were excellent points made by both. However, uh, Commissioner Scott, you, you read a letter uh, from an individual where you pointed out an elderly couple purchases a property to supplement their income, but they lose homestead exemption. If that elderly couple purchased uh, and built an ADU on their property, they would only lose 50%. Uh, Commissioner Long, you made a very excellent point that Pinellas County has invested in certain things and that's why people choose to live here. And you're exactly right. Um, we don't necessarily have to sacrifice revenue. We don't necessarily have to sacrifice the things that make Pinellas County such a great place to live while also hosing our residents. And I believe that if there comes a day in phase two where ADUs, there's, there's greater leniency, you're putting the power in the hands of residents, you are making that, I believe it was a disabled child, you're right in the backyard. What easier way can you check in on that disabled child, that elderly in-law, that, that brother who's on hard times, than something right in your backyard? Uh, I speak from personal experience. This is the most thing I am most passionate about in, in all the world. My family moved to Lelman in 1947. They have rented for 70 years to individuals in Lelman. There are seven ridiculously out of modern Pinellas County code <laughs> units on their property. They have a book that could be an encyclopedia on the, the history of individuals who have rented from them for far below market rate rent. My grandmother never worked. Neither one of them have any type of education to speak for, and my grandfather worked for 47 years as a paver. It, what resident of Pinellas County could, could live off of a single income as a paver and, and quite frankly accomplish the things that my family has? And it is exclusively exclusively through the power of generational wealth that has been created from ADUs. So um, I'm somewhat off topic of, of this item. Um, I, I would glowingly endorse it and, and certainly uh, ask for your all's approval, but for future meetings and, and phase twos and all of Pinellas County, not just Loman, um, I, I strongly believe that this is a, a, a great thing to consider in the future. So thank you very much for your time. I'll, uh, Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> it is very annoying to me personally to hear you say that the advisory board and everybody that's been working on this agrees with your recommendation and yet in this transitory time that we are moving through it was left out of the recommendations before us today so it was different I think okay different. maybe it's different but I'd like to see what that might look like when they all come back. Scott, when you come back and present to us, please include that so that we can look at the whole picture and not have to come back and go through the whole thing all over again. That seems Thank awfully you. wasteful to me, considering the time and effort that's been put into this thus far. Certainly. Thank you. And by the way, your presentation was fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Full of passion and everything else that I'd love to hear about. Yes. Issues yes. of form based code and issues that have countywide implications are different, different and that's the reason they have to be taken differently. Okay, there are, but there are there are things in the way you apply it in Lumman, the way his family applied it, and you have other ones where we have, you know, VRBOs and things that impact these and the way in which we govern these, so that we have to take it's those on a different path. I understand that, but we're in a moment in time when we have an opportunity and I'd like to get the best bang for the buck. So thanks. Certainly. Uh, Commissioner Justice, did you have something? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Heath for all the work that you put in. Um, serving on that committee, and it's not just punching the clock on the committee, you've really put a lot of time and thought into it. Um, and I'd tell the other commissioners that if you want to get a real thoughtful view of what's happening in Lelman, uh, the person standing in front of you is a great person to talk to and, and get that input. So just mm -hmm. thank you for everything you're doing. Of course, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being here and sitting through this very long day. Anytime. One, one, one quick comment. I knew it, Commissioner. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, it was it was good, and I'm glad you brought the passion that you brought to the table. I'm interested in that in that second phase. I think this first phase is the heavy the corridors that we're talking about, right? 
the second phase is where we get into the com into the, the residential communities, Correct. and it ha is it's more complicated. Of course, I mean it's we got to be very careful how we proceed with that one. But lots, I, lots of but legal. I'm excited <laughs> to hear. I'm excited to hear about what it means in Lelman. It might mean something different in other places. Very critical that we look at it carefully. But thank of course. you. I mean, but if you think about it, Leland's been our petri dish in terms of how we're making changes yeah. throughout our communities. It is, Commissioner Justice, thanks to you and all your hard work. I use a different description, but. Okay, well, <laughs> well what can I say? It, I'm me. I, I know we're going somewhat out of the realm of the decorum, but um, it, you think? It, it, yeah, <laughs> so it's late. I apologize. It's I'm way over. Day. But you, you, you mentioned about other parts of the county. Um, one of the most attractive aspects, in my opinion, is what is the future of the alleyways in Lelman? Um, you know, municipalities like Dunedin, like St. Petersburg, with those alleys, when you have someone who can, you know, walk in off the alley that, that's clean and safe. Mm -hmm. There are applications in other aspects of the county for our most at-risk residents, not just in Lelman. So again, I, I know I'm very much uh, out of yeah. the realm here, but thank you. And when thank you. you're going to see that at the next presentation because uh, uh, Chris will be in giving an update. Um, okay, so. hold on a minute. Commissioner Scott? Uh, Madam Chair, I was just going to move approval of case number CP-23-01. Look at you, you getting us back on track. Okay. Uh, you can do them together. Can we do them together? You, this you is really don't need to, to take a motion on these first because hearing. this is your first hearing. So long as there is a consensus to move this okay. forward, staff will transmit it to the state for review. And then at your second hearing, which I thought I heard might be December, um, you'll take a vote at that time after the second hearing on both of these two companion items. But again, if, as long as there's consensus to move it forward, staff will transmit it to state, which is the next step in the process. Perfect. I, I think I see everybody nodding heads, except for Commissioner Latvell. I'm, I'm nodding my head. Okay. What, what is this? What, <laughs> a little this, more is re, this is called a nod. Okay, a little more enthusiasm would be good. Okay. Move a nod. Okay. Uh, move a nod. Okay, we're good. Okay. No, just getting slapped back in. Uh, all right. <laughs> 66. 66. What? Yeah, 66. She wants me to take the timer back down to three. 66. Um, not giving him 20. 66. Thank you, Commissioner. We're on item 66. Clark. Thank Madam you, Madam Clark. Chair. Mm -hmm. Agenda item number 66 is a proposed resolution approving the fiscal year 2023 through 2024 annual action plan and authorizing actions related to the administration and operation of the Community Development Block Grant, HOME event Investment Partnerships, and Emergency Solutions Grant Programs. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right, what are the wishes of the board, Commissioner and Justice? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to see if you have a chance to really go through the actual funded projects through this list that are in the backup material. It's a lot of good things that are uh, being supported in the community. Um, and I move approval. I'll second, second on that. Commissioner Justice has moved approval, and Commissioner Eggers has seconded. Uh, is there discussion? No? All those in favor, then, please say. Oh, I guess we have to vote. All right, here we go. <laughs> and that passes unanimously. All right, now we are on 67. Agenda item number 67 is a proposed resolution amending the Clearwater Downtown Redevelopment Plan to allow for changes granting the Community Development Coordinator Authority to approve allocations from the Public Amenities Incentive Pool and modify and expand the list of eligible amenities. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right, what are the, re what are the wishes of the board? Move approval. Commissioner Flowers moves approval. Second. A second by Commissioner Eggers. Had a quick question. Commissioner Justice has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. What, can you just tell us how the, the difference is as far as the implementation in Clearwater versus other CRAs, and they have a coordinator in granting this authority, um, and is there a budget limit authority, and any of those kind of just general framework of how this works? Good evening. Good evening. Rebecca Stonefield, Strategic Initiatives Manager with Housing and Community Development. 
Um, so what this does, it allows for um, the um, the court, the CRA coordinator to approve uh, projects associated with the CRA plan, but it allows for the flexibility to also allow um, one of their other departments, which is essentially their DRC, to do so as well. So they would be the one; they would have the option to use utilize either uh, mechanism to uh, approve uh, projects. Is there a dollar amount, or I mean, is there is that part of it? Is just this, anything that's this already in the plan? It's not tied to any specific funding. Okay. All right. All right. Any questions over here? No. Move approval. Move approval. It has been moved by Commissioner Flowers, seconded by some Commissioner Eggers. Uh, please open the board and let us vote. And that passes unanimously, 68. Agenda item number 68 is a proposed ordinance amending Chapter 42, Article 14 of the Property Assessed Clean Energy Program Ordinance. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. And Madam Chair, there are two individuals who pre-registered to speak on this item via Zoom. Okay, and before are we having a presentation on this one? What are we doing on this one, board? If you wish. Anyone wish a presentation? No, no, no. Uh, no. Mr. Pressman. He, he does I know. Uh, Todd Pressman, 200 Second Avenue South, number 451 in St. Peter, St. Petersburg. I'll keep this very short. I do have a letter from the Associated Builders and Contractors who are in full support of this request. I personally, on behalf of all the folks we work with, I do want to say that uh, Mr. Knutson has been, if I pronounce that right, um, has been just absolutely great to work with. Um, don't misunderstand me, he held our feet to the fire, believe me, but uh, he was great to work with and Mr. Burton as well. Uh, so I really want to place emphasis on working with your staff and working out this agreement. And this also brings you in line with 226 other jurisdictions uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, Pinellas County was the only outlier of all of them. So this brings you in compliance or non-compliance, but in line with all the others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pressman. Now we have Rory King. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we know where Rory King is? Mr. King, can you hear us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. I, I just want to speak in support of um, the uh, voting in favor of changing this ordinance um, from the standpoint of a property owner. Um, the importance and the value of this program is um, extremely uh, valuable. There is a, a, a shortage of or a real uh, tightness of funding from other um, funding sources, traditional funding sources as I'm sure you're aware right now, given the economic uh, situation that we're in. And also uh, the fact that uh, buildings are responsible for significant um, changes in the climate, negatively impacting the climate, this, this, these funds and the ability to upgrade buildings and make them more environmentally friendly is extremely important. I can uh, also assure you that uh, as a property owner, a uh, commercial property owner, uh, there are, there's plenty of, of protection in the form of legal advice when you're getting into uh, financial situations like this. So um, from all those standpoints, and, and I'll also just second uh, what uh, Mr. Pressman just stated in terms of the success of this program around the country. It's grown exponentially, and it's really proven to be a very valuable tool. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. And again, I uh, would um, stress the importance of passing this ordinance. Thank you. And Ryan Barkas. Mr. Barkas, can you please raise your virtual hand so we can unmute you? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is uh, Ryan Barkas. I am the senior director for the Florida Development Finance Corporation. We also administrate the Florida Resiliency and Energy District, uh, one of the PACE entities here in Florida. And just on behalf of our entity and uh, the industry, 
just wanted to let you know that we appreciate the time staff spent working on this and we just look for your support and also here to answer any questions if you have them and I just thank you for your time thank you mr. Barkas all right so the wishes of the board are I just want to make a flowers thank you ma'am I just want to make a comment real quick um, I've already shared just my concerns with pace overall whether it's on the construction side or the residential side and I've shared some visitors at my home and so I'm really glad to see under section 15 where it specifically states that they will not say it's a free program because it's not free that um, they will not say it is the county's program because one piece of info I shared is how they were representing themselves um, so I'm really glad to see that built into the, the dialogue here um, because you know my concern is I would love to make things available to people in the community because as one of the callers stated sometimes it is difficult to get other financial funding to do the upgrades you need to your home especially when your insurance company is telling you you need to have an inspection and then based on that inspection inspection they're telling you need other things done um, but I, I did have grave concerns and still have concerns it's not everybody in pace it's just some people who take it to another level so it's not everybody but unfortunately bad actors make it bad you know for everybody but I am glad to see these in here because um, yeah so I'm gonna support I move approval and I wish it was more units than the five but I'll move approval we have a second <laughs> second and we have a second and I would just like to be on the record saying I have the same re reservations as Commissioner Flowers does but I see that we're moving forward a little bit and I guess I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt for now can we take it back if we find out it's not working you can always rescind your ordinance but do keep in mind that we are currently involved in litigation with a single mm -hmm. pace entity not to malign the entire industry mm -hmm. a single pace providing industry who has taken the position that they do not need to be enabled to operate anywhere in the state of Florida so with that said let's pretend that we approve this does that help or hinder the litigation it really has no effect because we're uh, in litigation in regard to residential pace loans this is all non-residential but for the caveat that it would allow multi-family multi units above that five unit I think equal to or above that five unit threshold it's equal. what we're dealing with are single-family homes just yeah. double checking yeah okay so do we have a second yes we had a second all right so let's open the board please and it does pass unanimously all right so now we are on 69 agenda item number 69 is an ordinance amending the Pinellas County Code chapter 2 section 441 uh, Pinellas County Economic Development Council repealing ordinance establishing Pinellas County Economic Development Council the public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing no correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the board to be heard what are the wishes of the board move approval back it it's been moved by Commissioner Scott second by Commissioner Eggers please open the board and allow us to vote all right and that passes unanimously item 70 thank you madam chair agenda item number 70 is a proposed ordinance updating chapter 90 of the Pinellas County Code relating to the operation and management of parks and environmental lands. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Uh, what are the wishes of the board? Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner. Second. What? I was just going to make a comment when you're ready. Me as well. Oh, okay it's been moved by Commissioner Justice second by Commissioner Scott comment by Commissioner Justice and I just thought Eggers. Mr. Kazi has been here all day if he wanted to come up and give us a long presentation <laughs> on it. I'm just kidding Paula <laughs> <laughs> hello Mr. Kazi thank you for all your work on this thank you 
Commissioner Egger. And I and I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity. Whenever we talk about parklands, I I think of the trail and still don't like the changes that we've made to the trail in terms of directional. And I get so many complaints about it, and it's all because the people are doing at different speeds and you're putting them all together from people in wheelchairs to people on motorized bicycles and we'll see how it plays out um, but uh, it's it's definitely a problem thank you I don't like it either yeah just FYI I, I have con some, some concerns with it as well okay so we, we can talk about that at another point but I guess we can tell who's on the trail and who isn't yeah I'm not an active uh, <laughs> I'm not an active participant oh, I just oh. couldn't help myself but I will I tell you I bought one of those walking pads on amazon.com so and I used that this morning cool well, I'm very proud of you yeah. thank you so much very good to hear see that new white people is having an influence May, maybe maybe one day i'll graduate to the trail but walking pads for now okay well every little bit helps okay so do we need to vote on this yes, i guess we do. yes we do all right there we go everybody please cast your vote and that passes unanimously okay so anybody have anything else for the good of the order this evening no, 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 no. You look like you swallowed the cat. Nope. Over there. Thank you. Okay. Well then, thank you everyone for your patience uh, with all of the little quirks today in the agenda. I'm very grateful to you all. You and I. When are you leaving, Barry? Tomorrow. All right, get home and pack, and uh, tomorrow morning, bright and early. I have every confidence that Catherine's already taken care of that. Well, she's happy packing. birthday, she's by the way. Isn't it, isn't it a birthday? No hey, Della? Is it his birthday? The 28th. Happy birthday oh, okay. to you. Oh, okay, come on, everybody. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, too. Happy birthday, dear Barry and Kevin. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Yay! Imaginary balloons. What? <laughs> so with that, can we go home? Yeah. <laughs> we can go home. We can go home. Thank you.